We won't just tell you. We'll lead you there. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Old Mutual Investment Group's tomorrow event. Um, we would like to welcome our clients, our own staff, and um, other invited guests. Um, my name is Sibo Nisongomalo, um, Sibo for short, and uh, I'm a, a head of one of the investment boutiques in Old Mutual, the Global Emerging Markets Boutique. I'm also a member of the Old Mutual Investment Group's uh, Executive Committee. Um, so in 2017, the Old Mutual Investment Group um, was awarded uh, the number one status in terms of rankings by the Kigoda Group um, in terms of responsible investing. And Kigoda's uh, Mike Davis uh, made a statement that responsible um, investment ranking, our number one investment ranking, um, illustrate that there are pockets of excellence in South Africa in terms of investment ranking and among South Africa's large asset managers. Um, but what does this mean? Why would we go and create an entire day and bring all of you up here um, to talk about responsible investing? Um, well, the United, Sa uh, United Nations PRI, or Principles of Responsible Investing's definition, um, is that responsible investing is an approach that aims to incorporate environmental, social, and governance aspects into investment decisions. Um, to help investment managers and custodians of clients' wealth um, manage better risk better and generate, I think, better investment returns. But what, 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 what does this mean? And I think in recent years, we're seeing an in increasing recognition in the financial community, of which we are obviously a part of, that ESG factors play a very big part in the generation of investment returns. Um, that understanding, and we're going to talk about it through the day, uh, that understanding um, and incorporating ESG factors in investment decisions um, helps us fulfill our fiduciary duty to clients in generated returns, but we're cognizant of risk. And the risk is not just the financial risk, but it's the ESG risks. Now, does this matter? And a few years ago, we could have looked and said, ah, this is just a buzzword. But if you open today's business day, the front page of today's business day, well, and yesterday's, and last week's, and the one, one before, before, it's, it's all, all about, about governance. governance. Those, Those are, are the issues, issues that are, that are affecting, affecting investors today. today. So, we've so we've got, got to, to talk about it. About it. So, so as, as people who are investors, investors we, we price assets, assets and, and those assets, assets are priced based, based on the issues of the day. Of the day. And we're finding that increasingly the issues of the day involve governance, involve social, you live in South Africa in an interesting society, and also involve some environmental. So if you take it further than the business day, and you look at the Financial Times, one of the biggest and most influential financial publications globally, actually today they talk uh, in their markets page about Nissan and electric vehicles. And this again has been a big debate in those publications. Why? Because the environment matters. And so as investors, um, it's our fiduciary responsibility. We don't propose to know everything in the old mutual group about this particular topic, but it is our responsibility to engage. So we've created a publication called The Tomorrow, which is under your seat, but I'll come back and talk about that later. A rich publication put together by a team, lots of hard work in it, and actually fruitful reading if you go through it. So in terms of the day, um, we're going to have several speakers. We're going to have two sessions, a morning session and a, a short tea break, and then we're going to have an afternoon session. Um, the morning session, um, we're going to bring up our CEO, Dave McCready, who's going to come and give an opening remark as to why we're here and illustrate why this responsible investing is worthy of, of us, us coming together, together and having a discussion about, about. And, and then, then we're going to have our chairman, chairman Trevor Manuel, he's also then going to come in and have a further speech talking especially about the societal impact um, of what we do as investors and our responsibility um, in the nation that we are in. But before we get there, we need to sort out some admin. Um, the bathrooms are on my left over here and, and your right sitting here. Um, but also how we are going to engage in the land of technology. Uh, I think first of all, we've got to say hi to our streaming audience because this event is being streamed live. So welcome to our tomorrow event. Um, and I'm going to bring a gentleman named Dave who is going to come and uh, speak to us about how we are going to engage on an app because there are going to be certain points where there's going to be Q&A where the audience can engage with our participants on the stage. Thank you. Welcome, Dave. Thanks, sir. Morning, everybody. It's not often, not often you get, get to an event where you get told, told to take out your cell phones and engage. 
So I'm going to do exactly that right now. So if you do have a smartphone in your pocket, you can pull it out. And what I'd like you to do is open up your browser. So if you're on an iPhone, that would be Safari. If you are on an Android device, open up Chrome and simply type in that uh, URL that was on the screen. Would you mind uh, just putting that back up there so everyone can read it? So just type that in, bit.ly forward slash om tomorrow. And with a commitment to go digital, we have an event app that has all the information about today on it. You can read the speaker biographies, you'll see the full agenda. But more importantly, we'd like to invite you to engage. This is a platform that is anonymous so that you can be free to speak and voice your opinion, and we'd like to invite you to do that. On the app, once you are there, so I'll leave it on for a couple more seconds. Type in bit.ly forward slash omto. M O R R O W O M tomorrow. tomorrow. And then, and then John, if we can just go to that, that uh, app, app screen, screen as well to just show the audience. audience. So, so once you have typed in that, that you should be to the screen, screen like that. that. And you'll, and you'll notice, notice on the right hand, right -hand side, the little thing that says on now live. If we click on that, you'll see right now, if we then follow on and go to the welcome, that's what we're busy with right now. So, one above that, just take a step back there for me. Yeah, back. There we go. And at, and at the, the bottom, bottom you'll see the ask, ask a question. question. And, you're and you're welcome, welcome to test drive this right now. So if we click on that, someone's, someone's beat us to it and type in a question. So just type in hi for me, just, just as an example. And then, and then hit submit. submit. What that does is it actually publishes it. Okay, okay so, so a couple of you followed my exact instruction and typed in hi. Well done, thank you. And you'll, and you'll see, see then you can actually upvote that. So, so how great is this for engagement? Well, thanks for saying that. that. Um, and we can upvote that. There we go. And so what will happen, your speakers will be able to see these questions coming through. And as time permits, we will get through as many of those questions as we can. Enjoy your morning. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Dave. Um, and from, from one day I gave to, to another, another who is uh, a lot, lot more important in, in, in my life. Uh, uh, I'd like to call the CEO of the, CEO of the old Mutual, Mutual Wealth, Wealth and Investment Cluster, Cluster Dave McCready, to come and give, give our opening address. address. Thank, Thank you, Dave. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank, thank you very much, much Sulu, and a very, very good morning to everybody. everybody. It's, it's Friday. Friday. We, have we have a chance to relax. relax. I have, I have the privilege, privilege of leading, leading one, one of the largest, largest asset managers in Africa. And we all know that the asset management industry is a very competitive in industry. In fact, we all compete, compete in a very cluttered, cluttered space, space, particularly in the, in the traditional, traditional world of equities, fixed, fixed income, income and cash. cash. All, all with the constant, constant endeavor to be that world-class world asset manager. manager. I have I have a, at, at the Old Mutual Investment, Investment Group, group we, we clearly, clearly differentiate ourselves, ourselves in terms of our unique skill, our experience, and our positioning in the future area, future fit area arenas of the investment of tomorrow that will actually provide those sustainable returns for tomorrow. And as such, it's very appropriate that OMIC actually hosts the conference today to have conversations about tomorrow. So we need to ask the question, why? Why is tomorrow so important? I guess if you go back to basics as asset managers, we have to invest in the future. And our risks and our returns are dependent on what the tomorrow holds. Now as large institutional custodians here in the room, we have the power to really influence positively what those future outcomes are of tomorrow. And so we therefore have a responsibility as leaders of tomorrow for what we do today will influence the future. The future for our children, the future for our communities, the future for our country, and ultimately the future sustainability of the investment returns for all of our clients. So investments and returns come with a responsibility. It's a responsibility for tomorrow and that's why it's simply called responsible investing. So we know that we already face many challenges and realities today. To give you some examples, by the year 2050, 
It's estimated that the population of Nigeria will exceed that of the entire United States. Also in terms of 2050, 70% of the entire world's population will live in cities. And I really don't want to leave out our actuaries in the audience, but a great one for the actuaries is that two-thirds of all the people who have ever reached the age of 65 are alive today. So whether it's overpopulation or living longer, or whether it's how to deal with this drain on natural resources, or whether it's dealing with infrastructure deficits or global warming, or poor governance that was mentioned by Cebu, corruption, unsatisfactory education outcomes or inequality or poverty, ignoring these realities will be at the expense of future long-term returns. That's the essence. We cannot achieve future long-term returns in a society with such reality. But for investment managers, the challenges we are facing sometimes themselves are the key to opportunity. Why do I say that? Because it's in the challenge itself where the possible investment opportunity lies. Whether it's actually trying to invest to, to deal with the increasing supply and demand for diminishing resources, whether it's trying to meet the complex financial challenge that we all have in terms of, of matching increasing pension liabilities, in a low growth, high inflation environment, or whether it's trying to get or enhancing low cost returns by doing something really sexy in terms of re-putting together indices in a different way. It's one thing identifying that opportunity, but it's a different thing putting our collective capital to work. At All Mutual, we invest in the opportunities of tomorrow, and that's not a flippant statement. We are the largest private investors in renewable energy, in transport infrastructure, and impact funds in Africa. That's a fact. And whilst this may sound very philanthropic, our track record shows that we provide a class of asset and a form of diversification which enhances overall risk-adjusted returns for all of our clients. And there's some really powerful success stories here. There's some really powerful human stories here. Let's talk about energy. In South Africa, we had a really successful renewable energy program. We were the first investors in public-private partnerships in energy. We've participated in all of the rounds substantially. One of our original investments was the Cookhouse Wind Farm. Now, it's a staggering sight to see. Imagine 66 wind turbines, each standing 80 meters high in the sky and producing enough energy and electricity to look after the requirements of three quarters of a million South Africans. But that investment has directly impacted the positive change in the surrounding communities, that of Adelaide, Somerset, East, Bedford, and Cookhouse, including an incredible educational foundation which has facilitated access of the community's youth to more than 35 schools. Take students and youth. In our development impact funds, we manage in excess of 12 billion rand, providing commercial returns but in areas of social need, such as infrastructure, education, and housing. Our housing fund, for example, is provided on close on 10,000 homes and accommodation for students. And that's in the inner cities like Johannesburg. Imagine that. That's 10,000 future leaders which can actually move our country forward. Take roads. You know, we all know that transport is one of the basic infrastructure which is absolutely critical to get our economy moving. Our private equity fund invested in the funded, funding of the Bequena Platinum N1N4 toll road. 
And through that, we've created 800 sustainable jobs. And lastly, just take Agri. Our African continent is fast being recognized as the food basket of the world. And we are proof that agriculture's long-term viability and profitability go hand in hand with the natural environment. Our agri-funds invest in mega farms across Pan-Africa and through that drive sustainability in addition to providing homes, health care and in very important training and education around agriculture. So there's a common strand to all of these stories. There are three things, in fact. The first is that there's a great investment thesis here. The second is that we're talking about superior returns. And the third is that this talks about uplifting communities. So what is all about this thing? What is this thing called ESG? So for some of you who know me, I'm a, I'm a pretty keen cyclist. And I could have had the misleading thought that that's some sort of form of performance-enhancing drug. Well, in a, in a sense, it is, actually. You'll hear during the course of today that our ESG considerations are fully embedded in all of the traditional processes that we have. And there's a reason for that, because there's very fast-growing evidence through research that shows that it actually leads to enhanced, long-term, sustainable risk-adjusted returns. But you know, there's something more profound for me about ESG. One of the first things that I learned when I got involved in the investment industry is that returns are all well and good. But really what is important is avoiding those great big disasters, avoiding losses, avoiding that Bell Pottinger effect. And the world, and mo more particularly now South Africa, is littered with examples like this. From Enron to BP, from African Bank to Longman and Marikana. And so ESG is real. It's actually very, very real. And more so in the current South African context. So as a significant investor in listed securities, and as the biggest fixed income investor in South Africa through future growth, our leadership, our responsibility, and our voice is critical in terms of enhancing industry initiatives and standards, and more importantly, in terms of enhancing the governance. Why? Because that provides the framework for us all to invest in the future. So on reflection, the importance of tomorrow actually impacts all of us here today. And you know, it actually unites us with a common purpose. We, we cannot do this alone. The future lies ahead of us, hopefully not behind us. And we've best got to start planning for it. I thank you very much for being here today. I am very proud of the team and the talent that is showcased here on behalf of Old Mutual Investment Group. I hope you really enjoyed today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dave. Um, our next speaker will come and talk to us about inclusive growth and long-term sustainability. Um, he is the chairman of Old Mutual Emerging Markets, um, and in 1994, he was appointed Minister of Trade and Industry by Nelson Mandela, and then in 96, became the Finance Minister. And under his tenure, um, our finances in South Africa went from a significant deficit and a huge debt burden to a position where we were generating surpluses. Mm, kind of forgotten that now. But a really stellar track record um, of amazing delivery. But I'll remember him for one particular thing, which... To me, he didn't quite deliver to me as a citizen of South Africa. Back in 2007, um, I had met a girl and I wanted to get married. And there was a man uh, who wrote in. He had tips for Trevor back then when we had um, the budget. And there was a gentleman who wrote in and talked about how, you know, in the African culture, we've got this thing called lobola. And uh, so uh, Trevor addressed this. 
and the gentleman had asked for tax deductibility of the Lobola payments. And as a guy who was heading down that road, I thought, you know, this is it for me. This is it. This man has delivered everything. Now I just want this one thing. But he didn't deliver. But let's welcome Trevor Manuel to come and talk to us about inclusive growth. Thank you very much, Mu. Good morning to all of you and welcome. In our immediate future, of course, as old mutual, uh, is the conclusion of managed separation. That's, that's about building a better base for our tomorrow. It's about the primary listing of old mutual in South Africa. It's a whole new play. And I think that that repositioning of old mutual in the South African space is going to be fundamentally important in changing the face of investment in this country. The, you know, when, when, when uh, uh, just before Dave came up, there was this, in fact, before Cebu came up, there was this clip uh, about tomorrow and there are these flashes of uh, Donald Trump threatening hellfire and brimstone as he did at the United Nations this week. And, uh, uh, but there's a, there's a different subliminal message in there. <coughs> In that clip, and you can watch it during the tea time again, uh, uh, there's the word artificial intelligence. And then the image of Atul Gupta comes up. Now, <laughs> I don't quite get it, but you know, you've got, to give some, you've got to give some creative license to the people who put these movies together because they always have these big sound effects and deep baritone voices and scary pictures. And uh, I think that's how Atul ends up there. But <clears throat> let's, let's take the issues of, of tomorrow a bit further and uh, I think the first set of considerations we must always have is an appreciation of the complexity. The world used to be quite easy. This building, this building was the tallest building on the African continent at one point. We grew up and had ticker tape running around it with yesterday's news. Uh, but the future is becoming more complex, and I think that's what we need to understand. <coughs> and in that, <coughs> one of the big issues is, of course, the shift of the center of gravity from west to east. Well, I'm not too sure about the long-term impact of that, because if... Uh, uh, Rocket Man and Sprocket Man have this nuclear fight, there may not be such a long-term future, but we leave that for a different day. <coughs> but there is this shift, because certainly by 2030, China will have the world's largest economy. And so all of the indices that we watch, all of what we try and understand, uh, uh, outputs by the Fed, uh, the rate of growth of the US economy, I think increasingly over the next period, uh, our minds will take us east as well. If you look at the shift uh, in technology, for example, uh, China used to be a manufacturer of all manner of electronic goods, uh, frequently just assembling uh, for companies. But you're seeing, you're seeing a big breakthrough. Uh, Huawei used to be just uh, a nothing, and uh, in a few short years, it's going to overtake the likes of Apple and Samsung. China just uh, uh, this week announced uh, or, or showcased their new uh, high-speed trade. Uh, it's called Fuxing, F-U-X-I-N-G. Uh, don't pronounce it as you see it. Uh, <coughs> but it's now, it's now the outside of Maglev as well, the fastest high-speed train. Uh, and you'll see the times reduced on the rail link between Beijing and Shanghai as a start. We're talking 375 k's an hour in that train. All of these things are happening. Earlier this year, China launched its first wide-body uh, passenger uh, aircraft. They also, uh, this year actually, uh, launched their first aircraft carrier. So I, I'm saying it's going to be quite important to watch because in our lifetimes, 
these shifts are going to happen and these shifts are going to have a profound impact on everything that we do, how we see the world. And that shift from east to west, uh, you know, by 2050, I think it's th the chances are very strong that uh, India will also have an economy larger than the United States. And so that would entrench uh, uh, a, a big differential in the world. <coughs> I think it's also important in this context to look at some of the changes uh, Dave mentioned. Uh, uh, the, the focus on uh, electric vehicles, and Spoo spoke about uh, a story in the FT today <coughs> with uh, Renault Nissan talking about uh, uh, electric cars, Volvo's already announced that they aren't going to build uh, internal combustion engine cars from 2020. And China's announced that uh, they're now working at ensuring that they will not sell internal combustion engine vehicles uh, in that economy. They haven't announced the date yet, but it's, it's on the cards. So the world as we knew it is going to be very different. Uh, in this country, one of the, the stalwarts now of our industrial uh, uh, policy uh, is the auto sector. But we build internal combustion engine vehicles. We had a little, a little flutter with a vehicle called the Jewel, the electric vehicle. Uh, couldn't see it through to production. And so sooner we're going to be left behind. And I think we'll see the effects of other issues. I mean, South Africa's major employment sectors used to be agriculture and mining, and uh, these have also been the largest shedders of jobs as technology uh, and a series of other factors have taken root. Important questions, important questions for us to engage with today because engaging with them today helps us understand tomorrow. <coughs> There are also issues that, that, that worry me, and it might just be a function of uh, my age, but you take the question of technology and privacy. Uh, what is it? How do, I, how do the successive generations already relate to those matters that, that we kind of try and hang on to? But in understanding that, we also understand both the value of technology well used, but the other side of it. Part of the other side is, of course, uh, the Gupta leaks. It's not very smart to have all of this information sitting on your server uh, and you don't quite know what to do with it. And so even in the way in which we use technology and the applications within a company like ours, a leading edge investment company, becomes an important set of questions because I think in our relationship with clients, we also need to try and ensure the preservation of proprietary information. These are big, big issues. Because the crimes of tomorrow are not going to be the crimes of yesterday. I mean, we still, this country is still at a point where there are cash in transit heists. And not so long ago, you'd find somebody with a balaclava running into a bank with a gun. But why do you need to do that when you can sit at a server and rip off the information of people and clear out their bank accounts regardless of where you are? I'm saying a conference about tomorrow needs to understand these trends, needs to understand the impact of these things on the lives of people, and then, and then ask a series of questions for our investment managers. Or look at the issue of fundamentally important food security. China growing at the rate that it is can't feed its people. Partly because of soil degradation, partly because of water issues. Uh, large parts of the Indian subcontinent have as uh, 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 arsenic and mercury in the water table. They are not going to be able to feed people. So the Issues of food security are going to be important. What kind of choices are exercised as we proceed through this? Uh, it's fascinating. Earlier this year, there was a debate on, or we saw the impact of uh, <coughs> the pest imported from the United States uh, uh, called 
uh, the fall army worm. There was a lot of concern about the impact on maize and a series of other uh, grain crops. A uh, fascinating thing about this is that South Africa survived it, partly because of the pervasive use of GMOs in our maize. Countries to the north of us that have prohibited GMOs, full organic crops, actually lost large swathes of their crop. And so the issues of food security and how these choices are exercised are going to be fundamentally important. I'm saying that these are matters that we must ask of our investment professionals. We must ask, like Dave did, of our actuaries beyond looking at fertility and morbidity. And so we, we will increasingly deal with levels of complexity, and part of that complexity is also in the fact that we live longer and we live at higher salaries than people did before, and we ask of our investment professionals to ensure that there aren't the reduction, the cliffs, between a lifestyle of a hard income and a retirement fund income in circumstances of defined contribution. Tall order. A tall order, but we can talk about these issues because as the old mutual, I think we stand ready to have these discussions, to be informed about the trends for the future, and to be engaged with a continually demanding client base as we proceed. Some of these things I, I tried to deal with a little bit in my life uh, as head of the planning commission. We were tasked with two things, I suppose. The one was to deliver a critique on performance of government, and the other uh, was to uh, try and draw together some of the trends for the future that could be combined. So that you didn't have a series of unrelated projects uh, but, but, but spoke about the future and will continue to speak about the future differently. We set as a, the key objective two aspects that I think are, remain as important as they were in the drafting process, and the first is to eliminate poverty. And you can do that if you can agree, agree on the poverty line. Big, complex decision. Uh, uh, at least two views for every economist in the room but possible. And then we must uh, uh, reduce inequality. And so much of, much of the work that we deal with uh, around us are part of the challenge. If you go back and just, just flash through some of the slides that, that Dave had up, uh, one of them is a, is a fascinating uh, aerial photograph of the South African geography. On the one side of the road, a very complex, difficult, overcrowded, informal settlement. And on the other side of the road, standalone houses, some of them with swimming pools. That's reality of life for us. It speaks to everything that we are, speaks to the inequality, speaks to the nature of the challenges. And unless we deal with the issues of the built environment, which we haven't been able to deal with in the uh, 23 years since democracy, I think we're going to pay a heavy price going forward. Uh, I'd wondered about the use of the venue, but I'm sure if you go out onto the balcony, look across, you can get a view of District 6, and it's always a reminder of the impact of the Group Areas Act. Three weeks ago, the Western Cape High Court took a decision on a place called Marikana. It's... Uh, just to the south of Cape Town International Airport, right in the noise corridor. Large piece of land owned by three separate groups, uh, occupied, and according to court records, by some 65,000 people. It's good to fly over there when you come into land in Cape Town, because when you fly over that Marikana, you're flying into a wind that comes from the north, and with it the prayer that rain will come to Cape Town. So as you fly in from that angle across Falls Bay, then uh, you can look down and see it. The challenge is that these 65,000 people are living there. 
higgledy piggledy. No water sanitation, no refuse removal, no schools, no churches, no playgrounds. Just informal settlements. It's a very real challenge in the context of creating a better quality of life because you know, municipalities can't go in there, lift the shacks, reticulate services, and put the same shacks back. And if they try to build formal houses on that space, then they would give advantage to those who occupied the land over those who have been on the waiting list. These are very difficult problems, but entirely soluble problems in the context of who we are. So that's one kind of issue. The built environment is a fundamentally important issue for us. But so too is the need to create employment. You know, we, we, there's this fascinating study that was done by the University of Stellenbosch. 60% of people who start school write grade 12. 37% of those who start school pass grade 12. And then you can look at the numbers beyond school. 4% of those who have started school will graduate within six years of having left school. 4%. And so we, we need to look at people who don't come through the university system. We need to look at people who leave school at grade 12 and fewer than one in two are ever able to, to enter the job or they enter the job market will find employment certainly within the first four years of leaving school. These are big challenges unless we understand them, engage with them, ask tough questions about where we invest, what we invest in, what sort of sectors will create maximum employment. As a company, we're not going to grow our client base and as an economy, we're going to sit with many young people who are unemployed, disaffected and socially maladjusted. These are big challenges, but I think we can talk about them because we are ready and equal to them. And as you move upstream from there, then you get into the space of education. What's happening in the education system is, is, is pretty bad. Uh, all of the, not all, but a very, very high percentage of people in professions and management come from 10% of schools in South Africa. What's also very scary is that even sports people in sports like rugby and cricket come from the same sorts of schools. Unless we begin to change this as a country, you know, we're going to pay a heavy price into the future. Now, these are not matters that all mutual investment group can solve, but they're fundamentally important issues that we need to factor into the calculus of investment decisions going forward. Tomorrow, is a complex place, but then yesterday is a different country. We don't have a passport to return there. So it's in our ability to engage with these issues, take them forward, factor them into our calculus, understand the nature of complexity both in South Africa and in the world, that we can look our clients in the eye and say we can deal with these kinds of issues as we go forward. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Trevor. Um, so what's going to happen now is we're going to have a 10-minute Q&A. Um, so our chairman, Trevor, is going to come up on stage. And uh, we're going to do this thing in two ways. They, it, obviously, you've got the app, so you can engage on the app. You can pose questions on the topic. Um, hopefully, we stick to topic um, in Cape Town. Um, in terms of how we intend to deal with inclusive growth, there the questions are. So. Trevor, it's best you probably come up and you address the audience. And uh, those, if you want a mic and you've got a question, then raise your hand. Somebody's going to come give you a mic and then uh, we will continue. We've got about 10 minutes for that. Look, the <coughs> On the first question, I mean, the, these kinds of plans don't matter if you don't have metrics for implementation. So we understand, we understand the education system and you know, there's, a, there's a detailed chapter that's, that's sort of cradle to grave. Education, lifelong learning, 
that starts in the womb with nutritional support for moms and then... But if you don't have metrics and honest engagement about the issues, then the plans don't actually get you very far down the track. That's the reality of what we're talking about. And we can do these things with technology. Let me, let me cite an example that I've raised with, with local authorities. You can deal with corruption on the housing waiting list in the same way as you deal with something like voter registration. Why shouldn't people have access to where they are on a housing waiting list in real time on their even dumb phone? Why don't we deal with these kinds of issues differently? Because that presents real opportunities. You can then see if somebody has a house and is back on the waiting list. You can deal with all of those issues. I must first be white before I can be a white man. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, dude, I'm black, so there you go. Um. <laughs> no, I, 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 I thought that uh, the approach that I took in life is uh, uh, I was, I was uh, privileged to serve the country in the cabinet for 20 years, did it, stepped out voluntarily. There are new challenges, uh, and I think that we hand over. I don't think that we, we deal with this white knight notion very well. State capture, I think, fundamentally important issues we have to deal with. We have to unlock the potential. Big challenge for us as a country is how we are able to restore the integrity of state institutions that have been caught up in this web. It's not an easy task. You know, we built the revenue service. We were able to attract smart people uh, who said, I'll give the country five, seven years, make a big contribution, look good on my CV, I'll move on. People no longer want to do that. People don't join failing institutions. You've got to change the character because the risk, the personal risk to individuals is very high. It's a big challenge. We can certainly support it. Old Mutual only employs graduates. It doesn't only employ graduates. It does have graduate professionals. It has to have graduate professionals. But it doesn't only employ graduates. Um, part of our challenge, and I, I, I was surprised to, uh, by the numbers the other day, graduate unemployment used to be very low. It used to be uh, around the 5% mark. I mean, because there are these steps. Graduates, 3 to 5%. People who've entered tertiary institutions are not completed. You kind of get into the mid-teens. Uh, uh, grade 12 uh, uh, passes, uh, uh, you get into the 20s. And by the time you get to incomplete high school, you're in the upper 50s. But those numbers have changed as well. Uh, and so graduate unemployment is now around 14%. So that's scary as well. Uh, uh, but I, I, I don't think that it's correct to say that we, we only do this. Look, part of the challenge, it's a very difficult thing for me, I, part, of, part of what we need to understand is that we must transcend party political issues. We have a very strong constitution, and before we deal with the parties, let's deal with the values of our constitution. There are deep commitments made in that constitution, commitments that aren't being realized, commitments that, that are paid lip service to, and I think that's a big challenge for us. Uh, and if, we're, if our constitution were functioning properly and if all of us were more interested in the quality of public representatives we have, then uh, I think the country would be in a much better place. We would be less reliant on just the courts. I mean, every single day, there's some big court decision. It shouldn't be like that. It should be the executive leading policy. It should be parliament overseeing that policy. And the courts come in kind of in the reserve. 
But every day, every day there's litigation. Every day some part of the state is involved in that litigation. And every day in that litigation, you can predict the outcome because it has the name of a very nice wine. From the state's perspective, alles verloren. Every day in the courts. Old Mutual starts at KPMG, there's a process underway. KPMG are the auditors. We're very concerned about the matter. Deeply concerned. Uh, partly because I know that the KPMG team involved in the, in the Old Mutual audit is a very competent team who find themselves employed by a tainted, tainted brand. Now, the complexity of these, these audit partnerships means that they are actually separate business units within it. Uh, it's something we're trying to work through. The Reserve Bank met the banks yesterday. Uh, SICA, uh, the South African Institute of Chartered Accountants, will make an announcement today. And the Old Mutual is looking at the issue. Part of our difficulty, of course, is that we need to list next year we need to separate the books, uh, and we're not going to find amongst the unemployed people, graduates and non-graduates, a team who will be able, who we can trust to ensure that uh, our books are properly done. The other side of it, of course, fundamentally important, is that we have to look at our own financial management inside the company. That's where we as a board must look first. Know that it is competent, know that it is thorough, and all that happens is that the auditors will provide an assurance over and above that. And if we don't have an adequate investment in our financial management inside the business, it doesn't matter who the auditors are, it doesn't matter if all of them are there, they'll never provide us with the comfort and assurance that we need. You know, I, I find myself in a battle about this NDP issue all the time because I don't believe that it's one or two projects. I think that it's dealing with the nitty-gritty of issues like education, public health, uh, community safety, and the functioning of the police service, and all of those things. It's, a, it's a little issues that make a difference. For me, for me, it's about quality of life. Ultimately, it's when any of our partners, wives or children, daughters especially, can walk around freely at night without risk that we know that we've changed this country uh, irretrievably. That is a big, that's a big benchmark, but we must, we must respond to it. The ESG question, I think, will, will dominate, Sibu, uh, will dominate the discussions, and I think I'll leave it uh, uh, to the differentiators, the investment professionals, of which I'm not one. <clears throat> there are a variety of ways in which South, Africa, uh, South African corporates can. Old Mutual has just linked up with a fascinating group called Partners for Possibility. Uh, uh, management professionals take of their time uh, and commit to supporting uh, uh, principles, primarily in uh, disadvantaged communities, uh, ensure that they acquire the skills uh, and, and do the upgrades there. I've seen very, very positive results from this, and I'm, I know that uh, since Old Mutual joined, many of our people will, will be involved in that re-energizing. And it's not a lot of money, it's about systems and, and cross-pollination of ideas. I agree, I agree on, on agriculture. We have Far too much land lying fellow, uh, enormous challenges. Old Mutual actually is, is involved in this in a, number of, in a number of different ways. There were unclaimed shares uh, at the point of demutualization that are sitting in a fund called Masizani Fund that is big in agriculture. But also um, the Old Mutual through its BE partners, especially uh, women's investment uh, group Whiphold, uh, are significant agricultural players now. The most productive maize producer in the Eastern Cape is Whiphold. And part of what they have from two streams, one, a legacy fund uh, provided by the Old Mutual, and the other, 
support through OMIG on, on uh, uh, implements, uh, large uh, uh, harvesters and tractors and stuff, making a very significant difference. So I think we, we, we're able to demonstrate what can be done and hopefully South Africa will take up that challenge and be able to respond to it. I, I should just whisper here that um, we had a meeting with the Minister of Agriculture, Forestry, Fishing and Forestry early in the week. He's incredibly impressed with the role that Old Mutual plays as a corporate, as a non-agricultural corporate in the sector. And so the ability to engage, make a commitment to food security and unlock uh, rural energy, I think, is a, is a big, big opportunity. Do you want me to continue? No. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. I found that quite um, exciting. And I thoroughly enjoyed that. Um, moving on, uh, our next step, um, we're going to have a panel discussion on one of our businesses that is actually key and that plays a major part in terms of responsible investing. Our alternatives business is a significant player um, in the alternative space in South Africa, where we not only as a group spend billions to get great investment returns, but also we change the shape of the nation. And so we're gonna have a panel discussion where Paul Boynton is going to chair the panel discussion. Uh, Muthieri is, Wahomi is also gonna come, and Shola Lawson um, is also going to come. And they come and uh, grab a seat, and then we shall begin. Okay. How this session is actually going to work as they uh, grab a seat is that Paul is going to um, get up on the podium um, and he is going to introduce and um, lay the context for our alternative assets um, discussion and he's going to put together a presentation he's gonna, um, on why alternative assets matter and where he sees the landscape of alternative assets. Um, and then he's going to introduce um, Shola and Mutheri who also will get a turn to stand up on the podium and share their views um, on alternative um, assets. Um, and so, Paul, um, I think you can come. Thank you. Thanks, Boo. Um, you know, Old Mutual has considerable resources devoted to researching some of the issues that have been spoken about today. And uh, Dave McCready and uh, Trevor Manuel have both shared with you some of the context that has come out of that research. They both commented on stuff that, um, you know, the actuaries had been working on. The one um, finding that has come to light recently and is possibly more disturbing than what they've covered earlier today is that by the year 2050, there will be more actuaries in South Africa than there are today. <laughs> <laughs> With apologies to the actuaries, my son is actually uh, majoring in maths at UCT, so. Um, all right, alternatives, an interesting space. Um, I'm going to just briefly set the context for the asset class. Some of you may well know a lot about this already, but it's an area that I think generally requires quite a bit of education still, so if you'll bear with us if you know a lot of this already. Um, this first slide here, sets out allocations across the globe. Um, so you see on the left here, North America, we've got a 29% allocation to alternatives within institutional uh, investments in North America. Europe, 24%. It, you know, it's a little bit lower in Asia, Pacific, and South America. But in South Africa, we're sitting at 2%, and that was actually a number that was rounded up. So. In terms of the global context, we are hugely underweight to the alternative asset class as a whole. And I don't think that's uh, the right place to be, but we'll dig into that through our panel. 
The second slide that I've got here just shows you know, what sits in the alternative bucket, because that's also a question that often comes up. So uh, you know, once again, we've pulled out three geographies here just to show the relative allocation. But if you read along the bottom, you can see that alternatives covers, uh, in terms of size of allocation, uh, spaces like private equity, real estate, um, infrastructure, private debt, hedge funds, and natural resources. Now, as Old Mutual, we are active investors across all of these spaces, but in our particular unit, which is Old Mutual Alternative Investments, and I won't dig into why <laughs> this is the case, we are focused only in three of these areas. So we're going to focus today, in terms of this panel discussion, on the three areas where we're more active, which is private equity, infrastructure, and impact investing, which is not actually on here. Um, we, we also have um, an agricultural uh, uh, team who are focusing on, on investing in the agricultural space within future growth, which is a different boutique, and they're doing some really exciting stuff, and obviously they've been commented on uh, today as well. But, you know, c together with them, we are largely, I would say, in the unlisted space within alternatives. The other big area, of course, is hedge funds. Now, we do have some hedge funds. I, I think John Gilchrist is actually speaking later today. He's running one of the hedge funds that we're involved in. But it's not an area that I'm going to you know, focus on today. So um, having covered that, three reasons to invest in alternatives. I think they're in principle three reasons. The first is performance. So if we look at uh, the first fund that we launched in this space, which is our Ideas Fund. It's an infrastructure fund focused on Southern Africa. It was launched uh, in 1999, so it's almost running into a 20-year track record at this point. It has a return history of 10% real. Now, in context, over the last 100 years, equity markets globally have delivered there or thereabouts 5.5%, 6% real. So 10% real is an extraordinary return over a sustained period of time. Um, that's our, our infrastructure fund. If you look at private equity as an asset class in South Africa, Rescura do an industry-wide survey on performance. If you look at their 10-year performance running numbers at the moment, uh, they're running at about 4 or 5% ahead of listed equity. That's private equity as an asset class within South Africa. If you look in the US, the same outcome. You know, private equity delivers 3 4 5% ahead of of, of, of the listed markets in the deepest private equity market in the world, which is the US. Culpers, which is the largest pension fund in America, $300 billion, the same size as our GDP, under management. They, they invest $6 billion a year in private equity. They model a 3% outperformance in their private equity portfolio compared to, to listed equity. So performance, we can tick the box. The second major reason for investing in alternatives is diversification. So you can you know, diversify your portfolio by being exposed to different sources of return, like infrastructure. Um, uh, timber in the US is a big, is a big uh, focus area. Um, uh, some of our impact areas are, 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 are also uh, you know, different sources of, of, of alpha, as it were. And lastly, uh, and I think possibly most importantly, you know, what, uh, you know, the third reason that I think uh, folks should be looking at being invested in the alternative asset class is the impact that can be had, the economic and social impact that can be obtained from investing in some of these different spaces. Now, infrastructure is a case in point. Um, you know, the World Bank has estimated that if our energy and transport infrastructure were up to scratch in Africa, we'd click GDP up across the continent by 2% per annum. Extraordinary, extraordinary impact available from investing in capacity that drives, drives outcomes. Culpers um, have focused uh, a little bit in how they look at the world, and by the way, Old Mutual has had similar views over life, but that you know, they're a big participant in the US economy, and investing in things that approve the outcome of the economy as a whole is a, a smart thing for them to be doing, even though the direct benefit of that doesn't necessarily accrue directly back to them. It, it accrues to the ecosystem as a whole. So, you know, putting money into something like infrastructure, improve lo transport logistics, makes the economy more efficient. 
that's not necessarily going to be a direct return to you other than the return on the piece of infrastructure you're putting in, but a more efficient economy comes back to you as a big investor in the economy. The economy as a whole is doing better. That'll come back to you in your SA Brewery shares, your, you know, whatever. So that kind of thing of, you know, investing in the ecosystem is important. And I think going forward more and more, we need to be thinking about this as smaller investors and also, you know, as a global community. You know, we are sitting here with some profoundly important questions for us going forward. You know, the scientists have said we have two degrees. That's it. From pre-industrial times, the planet can heat up by two degrees and then it's game over. We can all, you know, we, we will be packed up and shipped out because it's gone. So we have to start thinking about our impact and, and, and you know, collectively and thinking more uh, uh, system, systematically in how we look at these things. So just very briefly on um, economic impact, one example of, of, of what we've been doing as Old Mutual is we've been investing in education in the schools fund. We've invested in building 24 schools. Uh, we have just under 20,000 students uh, within the schools that we funded. And our matric pass rate in the schools that we're involved with is 20% higher than the national average. And our bachelor acceptance rate or university acceptance rate is also 20% higher than the national average. So this is about putting money to work, both trying to make a return in terms of what we're investing in, but very uh, stridently, carefully, and forcefully driving the education agenda at the same time. So um, with that brief summary, I'm going to ask uh, Muthiri Wahomi from uh, Alexander Forbes. Uh, she is the chief client officer to come up and just cover some perspectives from uh, an industry, uh, you know, the institutional investment industry around alternatives. Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here uh, in Cape Town. I was thinking a little bit about what I'd talked to this morning, and I thought, I'd start by looking at how do investors actually start to get into an asset class. Now, we, you, you may not know this, but over 100 years ago at the Old Mutual, the board of directors, who are then the people who are the custodians of managing the monies that were invested in policies, would only invest in mortgages, loans to farmers and in, in gilts at the time. And that was the case for a very long time. But over time, people's understanding of other asset classes, other investment opportunities, often shaped by a number of things, including things like the economy, um, the learnings of other investors who had gone on ahead, first movers investing in certain things. And with that, they would gradually evolve. So investing as a, into new asset classes takes time and it evolves. So if you look at um, what's driving alternatives in South Africa, Regulations are critical. So in 2011, there was a fundamental change in Regulation 28 that would suddenly open the door for people to consider alternatives. Talked to 10% in private equity, up to 15% in total in alternatives. And that's critical because there has to be an enabling environment. Before that time, uh, there was allocations to conventional assets, and an idea that if you had other ideas, if you wanted to venture into other investments, you had two and a half percent. Now that's a terribly low number, and even from a consultant's point of view, given the effort, the complexity in due diligence, understanding the asset class, that is not going to drive the analysis, the research that has to go into helping us get comfortable with a new asset class. In the 70s, um, new products, market-linked products, you'd start to see businesses, competitors of the old mutual like Liberty introducing property. And today in South Africa, when we think of property, 
we don't really think of it as an alternative asset class. And yet you'd have seen in the, f in the slides earlier that uh, the notion of property in alternatives is a big one. But in South Africa, you know, we've been investing for, in property for a long time. So the idea of what you invest in an asset class is, does certainly change. And then, of course, there's the vehicles. When you think of um, hedge uh, fund of funds, now, the decision to invest and how you invest as an investor, uh, th there's, there's a need, there's need to think through that carefully. Are you going to go directly or indirectly? Are you going to go into equities or in bonds? Are you going to go into listed or unlisted? And th that's actually a, an opportunity today because there are a number of private equity houses that have listed themselves on the market. Which brings me to the point, why would we, as investors, then keep those two areas, the listeds and the unlisted, so separate in our minds? And yet, they're probably part of one continuum. And perhaps it's better to look at them that way. And I, I, I think of, uh, I think of the, the trend that we see increasingly in listed markets of a, a significant reduction in the listings that we see in, in, in our markets, not just in South Africa, but also in, in the US and the UK. Uh, on the continent, for example, the, the listed markets are not as big, but that doesn't mean that there's no investment opportunity in those, in those areas. And uh, I, I was thinking about this, and we were talking with Paul recently, and when he started in his career, there were over a thousand stocks on the JSE. When I started, I'm, I remember a number of 600 stocks. Today on the JSE, there's probably less than 400 stocks, and 100 of which are investable. Now, this is also a problem in, in markets like the US, where stocks, number of listings has actually fallen uh, by, two, uh, by 20%. In fact, I was reading somewhere that um, as a result, it's changing the industry and it's changing asset managers. And that's what makes Old Mutual so well suited and so well suited for this, ma this kind of market because they have the opportunity to invest in not just listed, but unlisted. They have the skill set. So in the US, you have firms like Fidelity actually starting to venture into venture capital spaces, owning uh, companies that you may have heard of, like Airbnb and Uber, which are coming on stream but taking so long to get into the listed market. And if they had to wait for them to get onto the listed market, well, they'll wait a long time. By that time, the value has, you know, the, the, the early money, the smart money has taken all the pickings. Does it make sense then to keep them so separate? Um, and in, South Af in a South African context where you have one stock, NASPERS, about a fifth of the size of the market, does it make sense to ignore this, this, th the opportunity set? So I think it's very important for investors to actually start to, to think of the opportunity and to evolve. But it's complex. I, I wouldn't disagree with that. But that, that, that should not f make you fearful because you have, investors, uh, you, you have investors such as these at the front of the table who understand and invest to, to make sure that they get the best ideas into our portfolios. So what are some of the practical issues? There's asset allocation decision, that's the first one. Are we going to go and venture into this particular asset class? Because you, you're obviously always trying to solve for a liability, a target return, and that's the first decision that you have to make because this is the biggest uh, factor in the variability of returns. There's the manager selection, and there's a lot of work here that goes into due diligence, and that's typically what we do. And the due diligence that we would do here is slightly different than the one that we would do for a conventional asset manager. There's lots of legal work that goes into it, and you need to be working with legal teams. And, and this starts to talk to the, the complexity that that's, may make some of you shy away from it. But consultants are increasingly doing this. There's the fund selection. How are you going to invest? Are you going to invest directly or indirectly? In equities or 
in, in bonds. And those are important decisions to start to make um, as, as you start to put it together. And the monitoring is different. You're looking at um, a, a number of features that are unique about the asset class. First of all, you're investing for a period of 10 years. In the beginning, when the investment is being done, the funds are being drawn down, and you don't see an immediate return. And the idea there, when we look at our portfolios, is to make sure that when we talk to the investment professionals, we are asking them, how are their investments going according to, are they going according to plan? Are they exceeding our, the expectations? Or is the economy beginning to hit this, the, the companies, and what are they doing about it? So there's a very different discussion. But when we look at Savka's recent survey that says, what are the big issues that are affecting investment? A lot of them have to do with the familiarity of the asset class. And that's why increasingly when we have conversations and we're re reviewing our, our portfolios that have uh, private investments, we're taking to telling stories. And I'll end with this particular story. So this is a conversation and a case study that I had with some clients. And the story goes like this. So you're a, a budding cyclist, um, and you start to think, uh, and you, you, you've just bought your bicycle. You wake up, you're very excited, you've recently bought a bicycle. And where did you buy that bicycle? You bought it at the cycle lab. So you've had your cycle, you're on the way to the office, you want to buy a sandwich, you stop by your local Woolies, you grab a sandwich. Who made those sandwiches? A company called Into Foods. And these are some of the investments that are in the private equity portfolios. So you're driving on your way to work and you get a flat tire. So around the corner, mercifully, is a tiger wheel and tire. That's another company that's a, in a private equity investment with uh, one of our managers. Lastly, it's been a long day at work. You're feeling like you're catching something. So you stop at the local, get into the pharmacy, it's a Medipost. That's another private equity investment. The point I'm making is that these companies are all around us. We needn't be afraid. And in, in addition, you're funding investments <coughs> into real businesses. It's not just swapping of shares on the market. I sell, you buy. This is money that's going to fund businesses, that will create jobs, that will change lives. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I'd now like to ask Shola Lawson, who actually heads up our uh, business in uh, Lagos, to come and talk to us about Nigeria. We're privileged to have managed to drag him all the way down here from, uh, from Lagos. Uh, so, welcome, Shola. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Paul, and good morning to everyone. I'm going to talk about the African infrastructure opportunity with a particular focus on ex-South Africa. It works. So, we see a very large opportunity in Africa. The funding deficit is approximately $50 billion a year, and there's not a lot of capital chasing those opportunities. Now, what does that mean? That means that we are able to target quite attractive risk-adjusted returns. So we target 20% in US dollar terms on a gross basis, and we've got a very strong focus on downside protection when we look at investments. Now, in terms of our strategy, we focus on five key verticals. Thermal power, hydropower, ports and logistics, roads, and also midstream energy. Everything else that we do is on an opportunistic basis. So what we're doing in Nigeria, I think, is quite instructive in terms of our thermal power strategy. Now, Nigeria is a country with 180 million people. It's the largest economy in Africa yet there is only four gigawatts of on-grid generation. To put that into perspective, the average Nigerian consumes about 3% of what the average South African consumes on a, on, a, on a per capita basis. 
Um, just another little nugget. The immediate area around Tokyo Airport generates more electricity than the entire Nigerian grid. So clearly there's a massive opportunity set, but you've got to be quite smart about how you approach it. And we've done two investments in the space. The first investment, which I'll talk about shortly, we invested in the first World Bank-sponsored IPP project in the country. But the second investment um, that we're about to make is a little bit more innovative. Um, so we're investing in a company that provides rooftop solar, battery storage, and energy efficiency services to, um, on long-term contracts to large corporate and industrial customers. And we, we've done that deal because we've got the conviction that just like the mobile phone boom leapfrogged fixed line technology in a lot of these countries, um, distributed generation will eventually leapfrog large and inefficient transmission and distribution systems. So I'll go back to um, Azura, which is a case study on a transaction that we did. It closed in 2015, $700 million transaction. We took a large equity position in this deal. And essentially what we bought here was a fully contracted revenue line with a 20-year PPA, um, currency link, uh, sorry, linked to the, the, the US dollar. Um, and the offtake was guaranteed 100% by the Nigerian government. Even further than that, we reinsured that risk with the World Bank um, offshore. So essentially what you have is a long-term revenue stream, dollarized, guaranteed by a sovereign, reinsured by the Nigerian government. And we covered off um, some of the key perceptions of political risk, such as currency convertibility, um, the risk of political violence, war and civil disturbance were all insured. I guess um, the, the, the sort of key takeaway that I, I would recommend from, from this transaction are twofold. The first is that with well-structured transactions in difficult jurisdictions um, are less risky than is generally perceived. And secondly, because of the, the, the dislocation in terms of the supply of capital um, to this space, which is not a lot, and the demand for capital, which is huge, you are able to strike very attractive risk-adjusted returns. So this deal where we have all our revenue line fully contracted, where it's guaranteed by the government, where it's reinsured by the World Bank, our investment case targets um, uh, an equity return in US dollar terms, which is greater than 20%. So I think that's, uh, that's, that's a summary, and I'll hand, I'll hand over to Paul. Thank you. Thank you, Shola. Um, what's going to happen now is that we're going to have a Q&A. We're going to have 10 minutes of Q&A. Um, but before we start there and before we put that up, as I'm going to start with a question. Um, Paul, uh, just in basic terms, how do investors access alternative assets? We see the returns, they're compelling, but how do investors practically access um, alternative assets? And with, Eri, with that, with a, a client hat in mind, I think there are several studies uh, that have been done which show that actually investors are usually their worst enemy. So they tend to pull out funds at the wrong time and then invest again in managers at the wrong time, whether it's in managers or assets. So as also a custodian of assets, how do you handle the l illiquidity of alternative assets um, in a world where clients are keen um, to pull money in and out? I mean, just start there with Paul and we'll go to you, Materi, and then we'll hit the board. Okay, thanks, Ibu. Uh, I think, you know, this is the fundamental issue in the space that we are active in alternatives, which is illiquidity. And uh, as a result, uh, investments are generally structured on a fund basis where investors commit capital, that capital is drawn down as investments are discovered. So in the instance of Azura, 
you know, that uh, project was, you know, brought to fruition at the point in time we had to invest, we issued a drawdown notice to all the investors in that fund who had to then contribute the capital, you know, that we had committed on that project. Um, once those assets are turned to account, so if Azura is sold in, in, you know, seven or eight years time, then that capital, any dividends that we receive over the period of the next seven or eight years are returned to investors through the fund. So that is the fund construct that is kind of generally used in order to access this uh, liquid asset class. Um, and, and, you know, the premium return that is available to being invested in these assets is generally regarded as a, as, as, as a, a, a return for having accepted the illiquidity risk implicit in the asset class. Um. Okay, thanks, Paul. Um, thanks. Um, just to say that um, I mentioned earlier that it's only since 2011 that we've really had a, a regulatory framework that has said you can invest up to 15% in alternatives. And, and therefore, it's, it will take a while for investors to become familiar and, and, and comfortable as our advisors in this particular case. Now, when we talk to clients about investing in, in private markets, the initial allocation is actually a modest one because we want the clients to also learn through the journey. It makes sense to make a modest allocation and then from there, as you get to get familiar, you have more confidence you can invest more. Now, at a total fund level, um, it, you, know, you obviously have to have a very clear understanding of the liquidity needs of the fund. And because you start off modestly, at a total fund level, it shouldn't have as significant an impact um, from a liquidity needs perspective. That's the first thing. I think it's important to realize that when you go into this asset class, um, it is part of the contractual terms that it's, it, you, you get in and there's a lock-in. But having understood that, if there were circumstances where you had to, to, to withdraw, in some cases, some of the in, uh, providers will, will try and facilitate in a, uh, or, or make possible a way for you to, to get some of your money back. But it's, a, it's at a deep discount, so you really have to ask yourself, is this something that you want to do? Okay. Um, okay, we're going to go to Shola next. But before I say that, the top question there is on cryptocurrency, especially Bitcoin. Um, if you stay behind, we've got a gentleman who is uh, going to be in our last panel of the day, uh, Vinny Lingham, who is the director of Bitcoin Foundation. Stay around. Fantastic discussion at the end of the day, and he's going to deal with that specific one. Um, we really enjoy that discussion in South Africa. So that one we'll deal with at the end of the day. So Shola, um, how do you manage liquidity constraints in Africa? Um, look, I think, I think Paul has just touched on it. Uh, the, the reality is that this asset class um, is a liquid, and you are locked up for a certain term. However, we do see, particularly in the infrastructure space, where you have good transactions, assets do trade. And in the last two years, you've seen several um, uh, acquisitions of particularly power portfolios um, in, in, in the large markets outside South Africa. So we firmly believe that we're, in, we're, we're, we're into the best assets. And where we do further projects which are well-structured, there will be a market from these assets, uh, both from within Africa, but also across Asia and the Middle East, um, you're seeing interested investors coming into the space. Okay. Maybe I can just add to that. Yep. I think, you know, the risk in Africa, how do you manage risk in Africa, which is maybe a more uh, high level thing. I think key for us has been, we want local folk on the ground. Sh Shola is local. He understands what's going on in Lagos, you know, better than we would, even if we went and lived there for 10 years, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, you know, uh, embedded there. Secondly, even though we've got local teams on the ground, um, we, we look to partner with local investors as well. So that's a further level of risk mitigation. We also look, uh, you know, many of the investors in our funds that have invested in Africa are the DFIs, but getting, you know, the DFIs like the IFC or the World Bank involved in a project is also risk mitigant. So I think, you know, key to being invested in Africa is thinking very carefully about what risks you're, you, you know, you're facing 
uh, in each particular jurisdiction, and it's different everywhere. We went through a situation in um, Nigeria, which Shola knows well, where we were invested in a toll road there. We had similar problems around tolling in Nigeria to what they've got in Johannesburg. It's unbelievable. But uh, <laughs> no one wants to pay the toll. <laughs> Can you believe it? <laughs> but um, we managed through that uh, difficult situation, because it becomes a political issue, to, you know, return our capital twice over. So, you know, we hit a downside scenario there. We would have preferred to have been invested in the project for longer and for it to have run its course in the way we planned, but it didn't. But nevertheless, we exited effectively in terms of our return. So managing risk in these difficult jurisdictions and understanding what can go wrong is critical to generating a good outcome. Okay. The next two questions, actually, I think we, we can bundle them together because they're actually quite they look related and I think Paul, you and with Eric can actually probably deal with these ones effectively. Um, I mean, the one talks about it's a 20 plus return in US dollars. It looks attractive. What's the catch? Why haven't international investors jumped on this and filled the gap? And also, why aren't our SA pension funds so underweight alternative assets? So is it a capacity thing? Um, why haven't we seen a swarm, especially in a low return environment? I think it's a certainly capacity in the sense of understanding. I mentioned a survey that was done by SAVCA, um, South African Venture Capital Association, and it says the biggest issue that South African investors say they have is unfamiliarity with the asset class. So there's a lot of work that still needs to be done by people such as yourselves, consultants, and others to educate about the asset class. Um, that's not to say that we're not beginning to see some movement. Um, there's 162 billion uh, rand invested in private equity in South Africa. Last year, allocators uh, start, uh, the, the allocation to, to, to um, private equity increased by 5%. And we actually think it's going to, you're going to see a continued increase, particularly by pension funds, because I think there'll be a concerted effort to make sure that we increase understanding. And also you have this thing that uh, regulatory change around capital affecting banks and insurers means that they will no longer be able to be the big investors in all cases that they perhaps historically were because of the capital requirements that they are now required to, to maintain. So if you're looking for substantial pools of capital that can actually be deployed to make uh, uh, changes um, or to invest privately in South Africa to imp improve that opportunity, opportunity set, well, that, the, that group of people is you. You are the people who can make a big difference. And that's why we're having this conversation. Okay. Paul, do you want to add to that? Well, uh, maybe just two quick points. Firstly, I think you know, the South African pension fund industry is, is quite largely tilted towards being defined contribution. That, incre in, that increases liquidity risk within the fund. So that's certainly a, a theme that we've heard a little bit. I mean, our take on that is that you know, for a 10% allocation within a fund at a DC level, that should be manageable as a liquidity risk, you know, having an illiquid tranche of 10%. So that's the first point. The second point on Africa is, and by the way, the first international art conference, conference I went to, you know, 15 years ago, they had a breakaway session. There were probably a thousand delegates there, breakaway to Africa. I went off to find the Africa room. It took me a little bit of time to find out where's the Africa room. I walked into the room and I wasn't sure who was the audience and who was the panel because there were more people on the panel than in the audience. <laughs> I was one of four people in the audience, you know, watching five people <laughs> <laughs> present on Africa. And, you know, this is just having broken away from a huge, uh, you know, a session, which is the ma major session. Today, there is profoundly more interest uh, in Africa, I actually presented recently at the Impia conference in Washington. Uh, you know, there were, I, I was certainly with a thousand people in the room, but it was much bigger than this room. <laughs> so there's a lot of interest in, in Africa now. You know, we're currently, you know, Shola's team are currently trying to raise capital into a new African infrastructure fund. Um, you know, there's, 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 there's a, a, a much greater level of interest. Um, having said that, what, what are the difficulties with Africa? I think. You know, the number one issue is governance. What's happening in the governance space across Africa? And obviously, it's, it's three steps forward, two steps backwards, sadly, in Africa on governance. And in particular, in South Africa at the moment, you know, a big, big issue around governance. So in Kenya, by the way, where Mutheri's from, 
they've just uh, had a profoundly positive step, which the courts have found difficulty with, with the election process there. So that's a very profoundly important development, I think, that you know, local institutions are holding the process to account. That's despite, by the way, the EU having given the green tick on that. So what, what use were they in the process? But anyway. Uh, <laughs> thanks, Paul. Um, Shola, I want to bring you in on this question that was at the top, but now has come second. The 11 gigawatts of diesel in Nigeria, about the solar PV is yeah. quick and cost effective displacement. Why are renewables not a key factor? And yeah. after that, Paul, can you obviously bring us into the South African context? Because we've also had some uh, interesting discussions on renewables in South Africa. Um, and so, but Shola, can sure. you kick look, us look, off? Look, I mean, I think it's a, it's a very good question for us personally. Why are we not in um, on grid solar in Nigeria? I think. There are two responses to that question. The first is there was no formal process in terms of um, a large on-grid solar in Nigeria, so you didn't have the kind of coordinated process that you had in South Africa. And second, so there were a number of bilateral deals, a handful, probably five or six, and those deals did not meet our risk-adjusted return criteria. So I think the problem generally with large solar projects you're having on the, on the country is the experience that you've had in South Africa and also the IFC scaling solar program is pushing tariffs down to a very low level. So you, you cannot, or it's very difficult to achieve those sorts of returns, 20% plus in US dollar terms, on big on-grid solar projects. Having said that, I did mention that we've got into a, a very interesting business in Nigeria which does involve solar, but it's not on-grid, it's rooftop PV. Um, and we think that's a much quicker way to displace diesel. The, the grid is inefficient. There's big losses in transmission, big losses in distribution. Um, getting directly to the end user and displacing diesel usage with, with rooftop PV, with batteries, but also with energy efficiency techniques, smarter air conditioning systems, LED lighting, etc. So that's what this company does, and that's the, that's the, that's the bet we're making. Um, in, in the solar space in Nigeria. I, I just want to add something yeah. that uh, I think why South Africans, uh, uh, particularly pension fund investors, haven't invested um, as much is also that our markets have been remarkable. I mean, you, you've often yeah. seen the studies that talk to over 100 year returns in equities yeah. in dollar terms that are giving you 7% uh, real, and that's 2% ahead of everybody else. So the, perhaps there was less incentive. When there is incentive to invest, there's often uh, something happening in the, in, the, uh, in the environment, whether it's very high inflation that sparks something. And now the, the reason why this conversation is happening is because we'll, we are expecting lower real returns going into the future. Yeah. Uh, it's a quick one before you talk about... Um um, solar in South Africa. In the audience, if any of you have want, uh, want a mic and want to ask a question, we've got like three minutes left, so you just raise your hand and somebody's going to hand you a mic and we can uh, take your question. But go ahead, Paul. Yeah, look, I mean, the renewable program in South Africa, a lot of you know, know, know the detail there, world class. I mean, we've got a global, globally competitive solar resource. We've got a globally competitive wind resource. I mean, it really is a completely obvious thing to be putting a lot of renewables into our grid. Um, unfortunately, where government have landed here with this impasse on ESCOM uh, refusing to sign PPAs has kind of put a speed wobble in this program. And, uh, you know, the noises are, are good that this is going to be resolved, but certainly you don't know what the collateral damage might be because, you know, we're engaged with a global utility who were looking to have invested substantively in the program already, looking to make a much more substantive investment, might well have been the biggest investor in the program overall going forward. And, you know, we understand that they're sitting there with this issue of, you know what, we tended, we won, and these guys are trying to shake us down. You know, this is not a good outcome. You know, so the issue, regardless of what return we might face in this project going forward, we might just step back out of South Africa and go into a more reliable jurisdiction. So it's this, you know, what is the consequence of, you know, the outcome? So, you know, KPMG issued this report. It might have been slightly ill-advised, but, you know, the consequence is a double junking. That's, it's, it's, how do you undo that? It's, it's very difficult to 
pull that back. So hopefully we haven't kind of gone over the precipice on this one, but you know, the worry is that uh, you know, these actions have consequences. Okay. I assume there's no question from the audience. Okay, no? Okay, we'll take uh, one final question. Um, and I can see it here because the wall is down. Um, Mithiri, this is for you. He said, you, you mentioned at the, by the time alternatives um, like Uber and Airbnb list on the stock market, the smart money has been made. And the question is, which is a loaded question because, yes, I, I could take offense here. He says, are listed equity investors dumb? <laughs> What's the difference here? Okay. Is that a yes or no? Tread carefully, tread carefully, tread carefully. <laughs> no, actually. Oh, thank you. They're not dumb. <laughs> the difference is, as pension funds, you have constraints. So you can't just jump in. There's, there's whole sets of governance processes. And then the other investors, and that's probably using Bloomberg or CNBC parlance where people talk about the smart money and everything. Those are pr investors who have a, the, the capacity to make some of these quick decisions. If you think of the venture capital firms in California and places like this. So that's, that's just, uh, you know, perhaps a poor choice of words. But no, you're not the smart money. You're the careful money. You have the fiduciary responsibility weighing on you. And that's important. And you can't disregard that. And taking your time to understand and to make decisions and to come up with a framework, that's critical. You must do that. The rest who can rush and make those quick decisions, let them do that too. But, uh, you know, it's horses for courses. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, unfortunately, the time's up with our Q&A for our STEAM panel. Uh, can we give our panel a round of applause? And uh, <laughs> thank you very much. Okay. Up next, between you and the first tea break and a good cup of coffee, these guys make fantastic coffee. Um, Mr. Hal George is going to come and talk to us about global best practice. Um, Mr. Hal George is a director of investments at the Old Mutual Investment Group. And in his presentation, just pay attention. There's a slide where he's going to put up and he's going to show investment returns. Just pay attention to the emerging markets line. I mean, I'm a fund manager in emerging markets, so I'm just, you know, we're not supposed to sell, but let's just sneak that in there. Good morning. Thank you, Sibu. Good to see you all. As Sibu said, I'm the only one between you and a cup of tea. So I'm going to make this punchy and interactive. So just be prepared. By the way, the bathrooms are there, unless you want to go down three lines of steps. So don't interactive means you can move, so you can go next door if you'd like. All right. I've been 30 years in investment markets, and I'm going to talk about some of the trends which are currently happening. The trend I want to talk about first is one which is really not very often talked about. It's how do you discern the signal from the noise? So let's talk about some of the noise in markets right now. I've honestly um, given up trying to talk about Donald Trump. Let's just say he's a very unusual president and creates a lot of noise in the market. That's something we have to contend with every day. I'm from the UK, so I'd like to formally Apologize for Brexit. I think we took our eye off the ball for a second there. And I'd also like to apologize for the subsequent general election, where dear old Theresa May went from Margaret Thatcher, the Iron Lady, to the Empress who wears no clothes. Which is not a good vision to hold on to if you're talking about Theresa May, let me tell you. <coughs> and then you've got Kim Jong-un of North Korea. Okay, what's the GDP of North Korea? Anyone know? How big is this country? Eh? Really small, that is the right answer. $25 billion is the GDP of North Korea. $25 billion. How much do US citizens spend on their pets every year? More. <laughs> $75 billion. This is a small country. <laughs> happily lobbing intercontinental ballistic missiles over Japan. There are people in Nagasaki in bunkers. I mean, this is, this is weird stuff. So there's a lot of noise in markets. But what is the signal? And it's not this stuff. 
If you can try and remember, if I may, one chart from today, try and remember this one. This is the S&P 500 back to 1965, when the S&P 500 in the States was about 100 on the index. 100. Today it's 2,500. That's the green line. The red line are US profits. The profits generated by the US equity market. They're pretty closely linked. Yeah? <laughs> the fit of these two lines, for those statisticians amongst you, is an R squared of 0.97. So 97% linked. This is the signal. Profits drive equity markets. And what drives profits? What's global growth right now? GDP growth. Shout it out. 3%. You're at my last one. <laughs> okay, GDP growth globally is 3 to 3.5% 3 currently. Generally, GDP growth in the world grows at about 3.5%. So growth is okay. And if you look at the split of that growth, developed markets, 2%. Emerging markets, 5%. This is a plug for Cebu. Remember that, we'll come back onto that in a second. What's inflation? Inflation is a mystery, according to Janet Yellen, the chairperson of the Federal Reserve. She cannot understand why it's still so low. It's been running at 2%, an earingly 2% for the last 16 years. That's a whole different debate as to why inflation is so low, but it's 2%. Where profits come from is real GDP growth plus inflation, okay? That's your nominal GDP growth. So your revenue for corporates is growing at about five. Now the way a corporate's P&L works, its profit and loss account, is that you take your revenue and then you have your operational gearing because you have a large element of fixed costs on which your revenues grow. And you take your financial gearing because your profits will grow faster because you have a fixed level of debt. So your equity return is higher. So if you take that 5% revenue growth and talk about profit, profits are growing currently about 8%. If you take your financial um, gearing on top to get earnings, you get 10%. Doesn't really feel like that, does it? It feels like the end of the world. But actually profits, remember the chart, are growing at 10% per annum. And this is what they're actually growing by. The US is growing by exactly 10% this year. It'll be 12% next year. Europe, remember Europe? The basket case of the world, Eurozone crisis. Profits growth this year, 18%. Consumer confidence, manufacturing confidence in Germany is at all time highs. Emerging markets, that's what 5% revenue growth does for you. 24% profits growth. So you need to keep your eyes on the prize. The signal, not the noise. This is the S&P 500. And I'm not cherry picking here, by the way. This is the US equity market. I'll come back to SA in a second. This goes back to 2011. So what's that, six years now. The S&P was half what it is today. So the US equity market has doubled in the last five years. Anyone notice that one? During this period, I could have put on here Eurozone crisis, another Eurozone crisis, falling apart of Syria, Libya, and most of the Middle East, the largest immigration problem in Europe ever, Brexit, UK general election, Trump. These are all meant to be the end of the world. But look what the market did, and it's because profits are coming through. So this is what, profit, this is what markets are actually up so far this year. The US is up 10%, Europe is up 16%, Cebu's world, emerging markets are up 23%. South Africa is up 14%, these are dollar numbers, okay? It doesn't feel like 14%, does it? It's partly because the RAND has been strong. So your RAND return is more like kind of 8, 9%, but as the RAND strengthens, it makes us richer as South Africans. Helps when I go back to London. Spend my ran. This is the US equity market back to 1871. Okay. 
And again, I'm not cherry picking the US. If you take South Africa, actually over this period, let's take 140 years of data. What are the two best performing equity markets in the world? I've asked this before, someone might know. You might know. Anyone else want to guess? Yes, South Africa is number one. Thank you. Is that you, Trevor? You should know that. Okay, South Africa and Australia are the best performing equity markets over the last 140 years in dollars. I think Mathiru made the point. We actually generate very strong returns in South Africa. But look at this chart. The point of this chart is that markets go up in cycles and then sideways for periods of time. The sideways movements generally last 15 to 20 years, and they're generally characterized or precipitated by some form of financial crisis. Be it JP Morgan, when Mr. JP Morgan, not the bank, bailed out the banks in 1907, be it the Great Depression of the 1930s, which is triggered by an Austrian bank, Credit Anstalt Bank, migrating to the States, or whether it's the old price shock in, in the early 1970s. Do you see this period here? I haven't got a pointer here, okay. Between the 1970, 1920 and the 1931, see that little blip, the market going up? That little blip is the market going up sevenfold. Okay, This is the roaring 1920s. The USA market went up 700% before the Great Depression. So these are massive bull markets. And the latest one, which we will all know much more intimately, followed the consumer boom of the 1980s and 1990s and the tech boom culminating in the tech bust and the financial implosion of Lehman Brothers. And the point there, which is blown up at the bottom right, is that we are now breaking out of that sideways movement. So we are in probably the most skeptical bull market I've ever known. But it's a very bullish case. And what will drive this, I don't want to plug Cebu too much, but what's going to drive this is consumerism in emerging markets and debt liberalization in emerging markets. People are getting credit in China. They're getting mortgages. They're buying houses. They're buying refrigerators. They're buying cars. They're buying electric cars. That's going to drive the bull market, and it'll last potentially for quite a long time. So focus on the signal. Let me talk about another couple of trends. I think we know that passive management is growing. This is US equities, okay? The flows into passive on the top line, the flows out of active management on the bottom line. So you've got give or take a trillion dollars shift out of active and into passive in US equities. And what's driving that is fee pressure, we all know. Low fee solutions. We run the largest passive business in South Africa. We aim to be dominant in that market. But what's important here, well, two things actually. Number one, it's very important to blend passive into your solution, not just go completely passive. And secondly, active is actually still growing overall. That last slide was US equities. Overall, this is the picture. At the top, you've got active mandates globally. What's that, $25 trillion? At the bottom, you've got passive. So passive has grown by 200%. That's the growth of the passive. But you see active management has grown by 75%. Part of that, the market going up. But also part of it is where you can find inefficiencies, enlisted or unlisted for that matter, like emerging markets or frontier markets, you can buy active management and benefit from those inefficiencies. Now take a moment to digest this chart. This is a slight tale of woe for active managers over the last 50 years. 1966, or prior to 1966, the orange chart is just your return. When I started running money 30 years ago, it was generally your return. You delivered the return to your client, you did your best, and that was the outcome. Then we split into the capital asset pricing model, Okay, part of that return is because you're invested in the market and the market's gone up. What do you add over and above that? That's your alpha. So split into beta and alpha. And then what started happening, some of my friends, old friends of Goldman Sachs, Mark Carhart and the guys split alpha 
into factors. It wasn't because you were a smart stock picker. It was because you happened to be in value shares, which did well. Or you happened to be in growth shares, which did well. Or you were in shares which had a high, high dividend, and they did well. So you deconstructed your alpha, the skill of a fund manager, into factors. And those factors are called smart beta. And there are massive flows now into smart beta. Around a third of the passive flows are into smart beta products. And these are people now attempting to pick factors as opposed to pick fund managers. Be it single factor, minimum volatility, multi-factor, dividend at the bottom there. You can see the growth in smart beta, 37% over that period. That's Kager. So we have a big smart beta business within our suite, and we will supply those smart beta solutions to you as, as fiduciaries, so you can construct those portfolios. The penultimate trend, and we've just had a panel on it, is the growth of real assets. And this is a lot further to go, given the relatively low weightings already in these categories. Here you can see real assets at the top, that's back to 2005 in terms of the amounts and then the, the growth rate on the right. So real assets have grown by 10% per annum. Private equity around 5% per annum and hedge funds around 10% per annum. How money is still going to hedge funds is beyond me globally. It, it, it is a fee structured looking for an investment process. And it saddens me to see it. I think in South Africa, we've still got a very good chance in hedge funds because markets are relatively inefficient. Globally, those inefficiencies have gone. In real assets, though, that's a real story. To capture that illiquidity premium Paul was talking about, and I think Mathieu was talking about, to capture that illiquidity premium where you can, where you have large pools of, of long-dated assets, that's as close to a free lunch as you're going to get. And at the same time, you can invest money into the South African and African economies real money, as opposed to buying shares, which someone else is going to sell to you. It's a compelling story. And then my final trend is ESG, which of course is, I guess, the most important one and the one we're talking about most today. Just digest this chart for a second. These are the net assets in funds which incorporate some form of ESG within their mandate. And look at the growth over the last, I guess, three years. And then the green bar is the number of funds. Massive flows into ESG. And that's not going away. And part of the reason it's not going away is because of our lovely millennials. Okay? Half the global workforce right now are millennials. Millennials are people born between 1980 and 2000, broadly speaking. Then you get Generation Z, which is the new guys. I'm fortunate to have three millennials in my household, my teenage children. So I know a lot about millennial behavior. But the point of this chart is that two things. Number one, millennials, well, A, they matter because they're half our workforce. And by 2025, by the way, they're going to be 75% of our workforce. But two factors here. Number one, millennials love to save. And I think it's partly response to the global financial crisis. They saw what their parents went through, and they don't want to go through that themselves in terms of the debt provision. They want to save and be secure. And secondly, they want to make a difference in the world with that savings pool. So you can see for millennials, that 70, 85% of them are interested in adding to or currently own some form of ESG investment, 85%. And the market is starting to take notice of how important ESG is. This is a chart which shows you the median valuation for good ESG companies versus bad ESG companies. So trending up over time means that good ESG companies are becoming more expensive. They're becoming more valuable. So the market is recognizing it. And it's recognizing it in the performance generated. And this is absolutely key. Incorporating ESG is something we must do for the good of the nation and the good of the planet. But we mustn't do it unless it adds alpha. And when I arrived at Old Mutual four years ago, I said to John Duncan, 
with the fund managers, it has to be clear that this adds alpha to your life. And the studies are starting to show that it does. And intuitively, it makes sense. Better quality companies, they're going to perform better. And this shows you, this is a study from Merrill Lynch, which shows you over the last, what is that, 13 years, 18% excess alpha of high SG companies. And all the studies are starting to prove this now. And I must say, at Old Mutual Investment Group, oh, sorry, it's, it's also ha happening in, in South Africa. This is just one year, so don't, don't look at it too much. But this is the South African Responsible Investment Equity in Index Fund against our SWIX. And it's about 2% ahead of it over the last year. So this is happening in South Africa right now. And I must say, we're lucky in Old Mutual Investment Group because this is embedded in our DNA. And I think it's a function of being in real assets for such a long time because we have the benefit of very long-term capital because we're an insurer. And when you invest in a very long-dated asset, which you own, it's a real asset, you have to be cognizant of the long-term sustainable outcome because you're in, you can't sell it. And that function is, has been embedded across all our listed businesses as well. So the um, awareness and the embeddedness of ESG and the risk factors associated with, this, with it is embedded in all our processes across all our investments. And that will help us generate more alpha for our clients. So, equity markets are probably going up. Hold them as part of a balanced portfolio. Secondly, trends in sustainable investment are here to stay. Passive is here to stay, but it's part of a balanced solution. And smart beta is something we should use as part of a, a, a broadly based portfolio. And ESG is key to what we do at Old Mutual, and hopefully it's going to be key, and maybe is key in your lives already. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Hal. Um, a quick one before our, our break. Um, I think three things. Um, the first thing, you've got to come back after the break. Like I said, we've got this panel. We've got Vinny, who's going to talk about Bitcoin. I don't understand it. I've got no clue how this thing works, but he's going to talk about it. Then we've got Vusi Tembegwai, who's, who's a bit of a controversial character, uh, but he packs a punch every now and then. And again, they and Joburg, when we did this, they had a little bit of a fight on stage, which was quite nice. So uh, come back and actually listen to that. Discussing the future of finance. Very relevant, actually. Uh, very interesting discussion. But before the break, again, at the corner there, we've got our virtual reality stand. You put on these goggles and you look around and you can see in, I don't know, it's called 3D? No, it's called virtual reality. I suppose it's on another level um, rather than 3D. Um, and then the final thing is this book that each of you got. So our team and um, uh, Poncho spent uh, countless nights putting this together. A wonderful publication with some of Old Mutual's own um, staff putting um, some readings in here and actually some external guys. And so to me, take this home, have a read. I've read it. It's actually quite thought-provoking, quite um, interesting, uh, fascinating publication. And so have a read. But we're going to come back at 20 past 11 and then we will resume. We should have you home just after 1 o'clock. Thank you very much.
session. Um, but before we kick off our final session, um, if you look at the engagement app, uh, which Dave is going to put up, uh, something has changed. Well, not on this one, Dave. There's supposed to be... Um, okay, well, there we go. There's a feedback tab. And as they say, feedback is the breakfast of champions. So um, we would like your feedback before you disappear today. So during the day, and it's easy, actually. It's like you rate it in terms of stars, and uh, you work through that. There aren't that many. Um, and if you've got comments at the end, so add them over there. Um, and that's it, actually. So before you leave, hopefully give us some feedback, and we can, we can take that through. OK, so our next session. Um, Ultimately, uh, our jobs are to deliver investment returns. Um, and we can speak about responsible investing, but when we speak about it at the Old Mutual Investment Group, we speak about it as something, a tool that we use to deliver an investment returns, which is what clients ask of us. Um, and so our next three speakers are gonna actually speak on just that. So first up, we're gonna have Nilesh Hanji, who's part of our Old Mutual Equities Boutique, who's gonna talk about uh, about some of his experiences as a bank's analyst. He's been around for a little while, but he's still a, a young guy. He's been through a lot of uh, interesting experiences, and there's a particular share that he's going to speak about where he's got very, very big conviction in, um, and he's going to take you through that. Then we're going to have Tini Kongwenya, our economist, uh, who's going to be full of energy and full of life, who's going to take us through some economic stuff, um, possibly in a way you've never heard before. When she presents, uh, yeah, she does a, a fantastic job and she'll tell us about how happy you are as South Africans um, and then she'll take us through some asset allocation. And then finally, um, a guy who's not as young as the first two speakers, uh, Faroz Basa will stand up and talk about investing in emerging markets and how we use governance. And I say we because uh, Faroz and I are, are joint fund managers in the Emerging Markets Fund. Um, and then at the end of that, we will have questions for them. So you can interact with your app. Um, they'll come up, they'll park off here on these very, very high chairs. Um, and then uh, we shall have some, some, some Q&A um, from, from the audience. Okay, so Nilesh, can you please come up and uh, do your thing? the 9th of December, 2015. This was undoubtedly the worst day of my life. This was the day Jacob Zuma replaced the finance minister. It caused panic and havoc. It sent the RAND plummeting, markets weakened, and the banks bore the brunt of the beating. This was the crisis moment. The moment that was unexpected, but made your worst, pos your worst fears a possibility. For me personally, that day, I went into crisis. I wasn't sure if I should be paralyzed, ripping my hair out, and I could barely get to sleep through all the anxiety. But it got me thinking, surely this has happened before. In 1994, we've had the political crisis. In the early 2000s, we've had the currency crisis. And in 2008, we've had the global financial crisis. If you were sitting at each point in any of these crisis moments, you would have had no visibility into the future, just the fear of the worst that could happen. And in December 2015, this was no different. The banks had underperformed SA Inc. by 15%. This was worse than the previous two crisis moments. SA Inc. is a collection of South African companies that we look at in our world. The important thing here is this underperformance is effectively the price of uncertainty for the banks. What surprised me looking back into history was that uncertainty was the only certainty in South Africa's history. So the next morning, on Wednesday, the 10th of December, we had our team morning meeting. While we were all completely aghast at what had just happened, we were reminded to look through the volatility, cut out the noise, and apply rationality. Just as Howell said earlier, cut out the noise and look for the signals. Volatility 
presents opportunity. So we dug into the banks and tested the robustness and concluded the fundamentals appeared to be fine. The banks had strengthened since the 2008 global financial crisis. They had built up capital levels and de-risked. They now have lower leverage and more provisions to protect themselves in the future. They also have the ability to still generate value. This means they can deliver returns above the cost of equity. Another important point here is that the bank's management teams, just like our investment teams, have worked through previous crises and are more adept at managing through one. In essence, we concluded that we were not expecting a financial crisis, but the markets were pricing in one. So we went back into time to see how the banks had performed after each of these crisis events. And what we had seen was that the banks had outperformed SA Inc. after the 1994 elections, again after the currency crisis, and again after the global financial crisis. The important thing here is that the banks outperformed on a three to five year view, not a short term view. So after many, many hours of analysis, sleepless nights and a few panic attacks later, we decided to buy the banks in a crisis just after Nenegate and as a sovereign downgrade to junk was looming early in 2016. Fortunately for us, history had repeated itself and the banks had performed, outperformed SA Inc. again. But while the country was in crisis, one of the banks, APSA, was also undergoing its own crisis, an identity crisis. Barclays in the UK had decided to part ways and sell its controlling stake to shareholders like us. This offered a double discount in our view. One, while the country was undergoing a crisis, and two, while it had its own identity crisis. Barclays today is trading at one of its lowest levels on a price to book valuation. There are only few times in the past where it has traded this low, around the global financial crisis and around the currency crisis in the early 2000s. On both these occasions, the bank had suffered severe financial losses. It underwent a financial crisis. However, this time around, we are not expecting one. Barclays, in our view, is suffering from a crisis of confidence. They have now just gained their independence and can control their own destiny without any constraints from its parent. Management have to show and deliver a path to its new future. They have just gained a billion dollars from the separation and can invest this in its diverse African footprint and most importantly, can now control its risk appetite. This is its ability to price and lend more appropriately. This presents an enormous opportunity in our view, but while we wait, they can afford to pay a handsome dividend, one that yields over 7.5%. Take note though, we do understand the risks. Our investment process involves a scenario analysis using bull and bear cases. In our base case, we already assume for a sovereign downgrade on the local currency rating. In our bear case valuation, we use an even tougher economic scenario, one that involves corporate blowouts and job losses. And even still, Barclays today is trading below our bear case valuation. This gives us the conviction to buy. We have participated in two of the Barclays' sales downs. We have now built a position that warrants a top 10 holding in our equity portfolios. Now we have to have the patience to see the value unfold as we see it here. So it has been quite a journey this far, one with many ups and downs, but one that is certainly still not over. Here are a few reminders that keeps our investment team focused every day. We understand crisis moments and their potential to deliver alpha generation opportunities over the long term. Volatility provides opportunity. History provides us with evidence. We have the benefit to look back into the rearview mirror and have seen history can repeat itself. Uncertainty is the only certainty. This is extremely important. We understand the risks and what markets are pricing in. Our investment team 
has lived through many crises and have developed a disciplined investment process. We understand crisis moments. We use scenario analysis to understand the range of outcomes where we can invest. And finally, we need the confidence in the darkest hours. We spend tons of hours understanding crisis moments, looking back into history, and understanding the risks. This gives us the confidence and conviction to invest for the long term to the benefit of our clients. Now we need the patience for the value to emerge. Thank you. So morning, so good morning everyone. Today I'm going to talk to you about investing in the South African context. Let's start off with a fun fact just to break the ice a little bit. So the United Nations puts together this happiness report every year in March. And this year, as they were ranking 155 countries in the happiness index, they found that South Africa is ranked 101 in this happiness index. That is far below Brazil, a country that's trying to impeach their second president, by the way, and below China as well, which we very well know is a country that's less democratic than our own. And before the question comes up, no, this was not done after the Springboks lost. <laughs> but as you can see, South Africans are quite a depressed bunch of people. Now, if you think about the macroeconomic environment, you can actually understand why South Africans think that they're in a crisis. For instance, in that first quarter when we had that recession, now it was a widespread weakness in the economy. All the sectors, with the exception of mining and agriculture, contracted in the first quarter. There was a widespread weakness. And following that, in that same month in March, we had Praveen Gordon and ABC Jonas recalled from the UK, and then a round of effect events happening after that, cabinet reshuffle, leading to us being downgraded in terms of our foreign currency rating to sub-investment grade territory by all three rating agencies, S&P, Moody's, and Fitch. And let's not forget all of the political turmoil that we have. These Gupta emails, um, even leading to KPMG executives having to step down. All of this that leading up to the ANC elective conference, talk about this perhaps being postponed. I mean, that's bad news. And you wonder, with all of this political uncertainty that we have, it just keeps leading into a lack of confidence. And that's something that we can feel in this economy, is that South Africans are unhappy. And in fact, in the survey, the respondents said that they'd rather give up their democracy in order to just have a running government that does what it has to. But then when we sit and think about how depressed we are, the RAND somehow is telling us a different story. The RAND has been quite resilient. And we get asked a lot of questions about why has it been this strong? And the truth is that the global economy has actually been bailing us out. So if you think about global growth, and this is what Hal ran you through in terms of profits matter. So global growth in the second quarter printed an annualized rate of 3.8%. Now that is the best that it's been in the, the past five years. So you're seeing the synchronized upturn in growth. And it's not just happening in the US, it's happening in Europe as well. And remember, Europe is important to countries like South Africa because they are our biggest exporting country region, right? So it's happening in Europe, it's happening in Japan as well, a country that was stuck in stagflation, second quarter grew by 4%. So it is a synchronized upturn in growth. Even Christine Lagarde, the biggest bear, she's the IMF chair, she says spring is in the global economy, and that's what's helping the RAND. Then of course you have the US tensions with North Korea and all of this noise. Remember, we have to separate the noise versus signal. And what is the signal into us? What this is signaling is that, remember when Trump came into office in November and he promised this fiscal reform that he would implement that would drive US growth to the extent that the Fed would have to be more aggressive in hiking interest rates. 
and then that would lead to a stronger dollar, and a stronger dollar we know is bad for emerging market currencies. But now the market is starting to wonder whether this fiscal reform is actually coming and whether the Fed is are going to hike as aggressively as they had intended to. And so when we think about the Fed as well, they're wondering where is inflation? We're not seeing inflation. And they didn't hike on the Wednesday. They signaled maybe they'll hike in December as well. But what the market is, is they're discounting the number of hikes that the Fed will have. And that's been leading to a softer dollar. We even have in the Eurozone where the ECB has said they will keep monetary policy accommodative for as long as they have to until they see signs of inflation. So easy monetary policy globally is good for South Africa. A weaker dollar, good for South Africa as well. And global growth as well as we're an open economy, that's been helping keep the RAND resilient. But if I go back to this growth story, and I want to show you this. This is Global Manufacturing Purchasing Managers Index. So what the survey does, it goes to a couple of manufacturing companies and it asks them, are you starting to see new orders pick up? Are you starting to see export orders pick up? And it tries to gouge the level of activity that's going on in these manufacturing companies. So anything above that 50 line is expansion territory. So activity picking up. Anything below that 50 line is contraction. Now remember I said it's in synchronized upturn in growth. The rest of the world is growing, while South Africa, as you can see there, is lagging behind. And the key risk here is that when global growth starts to roll over, and we're in the sweet spot where we should be growing as well, what happens when we have to stand alone? So the big question I keep getting asked is why aren't we growing? Why is South Africa still in this low growth where potential growth is about one to one and a half percent, while the rest of emerging markets is growing at five to six percent? The simple answer to that is confidence, or rather the lack thereof. And I want to chat to you about household consumption as well as private investment. So weak confidence is holding the economy back. As you can see here from 2010 to 2013, real household consumption increased by 11.2% in 2014 to 2016. This was only 2.5%. So when we think about the consumer, inflation's coming down, uh, Wednesday's print was 4.8%, our year-end forecast is 4.5%, so that's at the midpoint of the 3 to 6% target band for the Reserve Bank. In fact, we all expected the Reserve Bank to cut because they had the best opportunity. And they worry about political uncertainty and what that does to the RAND. And we're wondering that they might be committing a policy risk because this is the perfect time for them to be cutting interest rates and relieving that pressure of the consumer. But what we're finding now is actually the consumer is using this time to deleverage. They're saving because they're worried about the future of this economy. They have no idea where things are going. So instead of spending, they're using this time to deleverage. In fact, Nilesh will tell you, the banks are saying that they have these great credit loss ratios and you're thinking, ah, quality loans. No, there's just no demand for credit any longer. Households are not spending. And then real private investment. Uh, we have an example close to us, which is the mining sector. If Roger Baxter can stand up, the CEO of the mining chambers, can stand up on an international stage in Australia and say that we as a mining sector have lost confidence in the minister and have South Africa on our no-go list for investment. Now that is a crisis. And you can see it here, 2010 to 2013, up 18%. 2014 to 2016, down 8.2%. And in the previous quarter, it was down 6%. So if you use the simple growth formula, growth is equal to consumption plus investment plus government spending and net exports. We've lost the consumption and investment levers. And that then worries us in terms of any other growth levers for South Africa. So this dismal growth outlook then adds pressure to the Piscas. As you can see there, revenue and expenditure actually outpacing revenue by quite a bit. And in the first quarter, the South African Revenue Services said that they had an under, um, under recovery of 13 and a half billion in terms of tax revenues. Extrapolate that 
And that's about 40 to 50 billion for this fiscus that we have in terms of uh, under, um, under recovery of revenues. So if you think about this, expenditure, more than 60% of expenditure is based on social grants, wages, as well as your debt servicing costs. Those are very difficult things to cut. And this is our worry, especially if you think about how debt, debt to GDP at the end of this year, is set to reach about 51% of GDP. And then if you add SOEs, so those contingent liabilities, the guarantees that we, we give to ESCOM as well as SAA, this comes to about 73% of GDP. So that is in the territory of our local currency rating being in sub-investment grade. Ask me if we're getting downgraded next year. Someone tell me, why not? And that is our worry in terms of South Africa, is that unless large-scale structural reforms is implemented, the outlook for the long-term outlook remains challenging. And I mean, it's easy for me to stand up here and say, structural reform, structural reform. But what are the low-hanging fruits that government can do in order to change you know, the outlook for our growth? Well, there are actually some low-hanging fruits. The first one being political certainty. If businesses are a bit more confident about the economy, confident about where politics is going, the end of the year with the ANC elective conference, some policy certainty will help drive sentiment and therefore investment. SOE intervention as well. As I mentioned, those contingent liabilities, they weigh a lot on the fiscus in terms of the debt. And some good governance in the SOEs could help in terms of um, taking that pressure off the fiscus. And the mining charter as well. The mining sector employs about 6% of our labor force. If we could have some certainty in the mining charter, then that mining sector wouldn't be in the crisis it is today. And it could um, take some pressure off in terms of the job losses that we've seen. Even Impala recently saying that they may restructure and shed some jobs. And there are lots of other things that government has in terms of low-hanging fruit. Tourism, look around you. I love this country. It's so beautiful. This is one sector that we can use to drive the economy, yet we shoot ourselves in the foot and make it difficult for people to come here with their children. Simple things that government can do in order to turn this trajectory around. So in terms of our long-term strategic asset allocations, I sit in the team of asset allocators, rated number one in South Africa by BNB Pariba. And so economics is all nice. We do this, we put a lot of time into researching these themes, the question is, what does that mean in terms of our investment process and so that we can deliver our clients' long-term objectives? And really what this means is that we're overweight growth assets, as you can see there. We like growth assets, you can see. We've seen the synchronized upturn in growth. And we're underweight fixed income assets. In that growth assets, we're overweight global equity, um, less so SA Inc. because of the SA economy and they're linked to um, GDP here. And then in property, we like property over financials. And then in terms of fixed income assets, we're overweight cash versus bonds. Bonds because of the risk with the credit rating outcome um, next year. And cash, we're overweight cash so that we can find opportunities where equities become cheaper so we can deploy um, some cash there. So this is a long-term strategic asset allocation. And unfortunately, the outlook does look a bit dismal in South Africa that there are various ways that we find opportunities. We're here to deliver our long-term object, our clients' long-term objectives. Thank you. Thank you, Tineko. Um, I must say, I'll be talking to you about emerging markets and how we use corporate governance to create additional value for shareholders. But I thought I'll just start off with, um, I used to be a SA fund manager. And you know, in South Africa, we live in this little bubble. We're SA fund managers. We think South Africa is where all the investment opportunities are. And our former CEO came to, do to myself and, and said, listen, you guys actually need to move to global. And more specifically, emerging markets. Our first thoughts were, we were horrified. Um, you know, these m massive oil companies that have corporate governance issues in, in Russia, Brazilian companies, where the president's going to be
be impeached, don't talk about China. I mean, when we think about China, we think about the commodities boom and a bubble. But I'm going to take you through how it's actually been the best thing we've ever uh, done. I mean, listening to Tineko, she's the eternal optimist, and she didn't <laughs> instill much confidence on the SA economy in me. So let's start off with how we use governance. I mean, John Duncan's here, you know, he'll tell you. I'm the worst portfolio manager to deal with because <laughs> I always want value out of his, his systems, and I'll show you how we actually use this to create value. Um, and just before I start off with, this was a very interesting um, headline I've seen. Um, we all know SAA is topical at the moment. People don't know whether the carrier would be here for the next 10 years or not. And the minister mentioned that, you know, they need to depoliticize this company. Uh, but he also mentioned that the bad performance is as a result of corporate governance. And I think he was really spot on here. Um, because if you look at, at ESCOM, and we'll get back to it lately, it's not only South Africa. The fi Financial Times recently put out uh, an article on state-owned enterprises. Um, state-owned enterprises are the chief destroyers of value, and they said, you know, by just avoiding these companies, you can add value to shareholders. And I thought we'd talk about all the, the corporate governance issues we have in South Africa, and I thought this one was quite interesting, Petrobas. Now, if any of you know, the, the former president has been impeached in Brazil, and it was largely around Petrobas. In fines alone, they paid, I mean, sorry, in um, bribes alone, they paid $6 billion. It cost the state between 30 and $40 billion, just this one scandal. So, you know, there's, there's many of these instances in emerging markets, and I can gi give you some good examples of it. But navigating these markets, you need a really firm corporate governance framework to guide you through. So let's just get back to the SA example. We as, as fund managers or analysts, we value cash flows. Everybody will tell you we value the cash flows, we do discounted cash flows. So it's important for us to understand what does a company generate. So in this case, um, the green line being the cash flow from operations of SAA. And you can see in the last five years, with the low oil price, they actually haven't generated cash. Also, the investment activity has even drained the cash flow more. Then we look at the cash flow from financing. So where is it all come out from? Why is it topical? 28 billion rand of bailouts to SAA. Yet, I mean, I look at my global team, and they're looking at opportunities where airlines in the US, in Canada, and even in Europe are making th the best free cash flow that they've ever seen. So that's just an example of, of why we need to look at corporate governance. So an another study by Bloomberg looking at these companies uh, looked at state-owned entities. So if you look at state-owned entities, if you go back to 2005, you would, have, you would have actually been flat. But if you take inflation into account, had you invested in these companies, you would have gone backwards. If you had invested in the index, and I hope my passive friends aren't here, <laughs> You know, you would have done relatively well, but still adjusting for inflation, you know, you would have been there and thereabouts. If you had invested in entrepreneurial and family-owned companies, that's where the alpha is. So think about the governance in those companies and what you need to look out for going forward. So why, why have I used the state-owned entity as example? Because if you look at South Africa, I mean, we have Telcom as the one state-owned entity and we have big shareholders in there all the time. If things go wrong, you know, there's, there's very good corporate governance frameworks in South Africa. In emerging markets, it's a bit different. When you look at the biggest market in emerging markets, China, 60% of those companies are state-owned entities. Now, remember, China's not a democracy. If I tell the bank they need to, to start lending to SOEs, they need to do it. So. Corporate governance is vital in emerging markets. It's not only in China, it is our biggest market, but it really plays a big role in what we do and how we create alpha for our clients. So how do we use it and what do we do? Um, our framework is all around understanding who the custodians of capital are. 
we don't invest with any company we don't meet face to face or have interactions with. So we travel extensively to emerging markets to not only meet the companies, but also their competitors, the industry players, government officials. We need to understand the whole framework within which we're investing. And then integrity, very important. I'll show you in a later slide some of the key questions that we ask. You know, um, as on Mutual, we always talk of invest alongside the fund manager. Trust me, we are. 80% um, of my wealth is, is invested in our fund and I'm, I'm aligned to our clients. Integrity, very, very important. Accountability and incentives. When you look at all successful companies and companies that have done well over the last 10 years, if you look at management in incentives, accountability, um, those are what drive behavior. Imagine sitting across the, t the table with the management team and you saying, okay, what is your return on investment you're expecting from this big capital project you've just implemented? And he says, no, I've, I've done it because you know I'm employing more people, my top line's gonna grow. So clearly you are on two totally different planets because you're worried about returns, he's worried about employment and his top line. So accountability, very, very important. <coughs> and then the last two topics, protecting shareholder rights and, uh, and, and treating shareholders equally. Board structures in emerging markets are notoriously, how shall I say, it's structured in a way that, that not conducive to, to investing. So for example, um, you open the financial statements of a company and you'll see the chairman um, and his son, uh, the father is the chairman, the son is the CEO, the daughter's head of the remunerations committee, and then you start getting into muddling into other territory. So treating shareholders fairly, understanding board structures, these are very, very important um, things that we take into account. So our governance framework, um, just briefly taking you through it, it's, it's a five point check with 100 questions. Internally developed, we've created it um, over the last six, seven years and just refined it. And you know, value creation capital management we'll get back to. We spoke a bit about board structure and shareholder structure, also vital for us in understanding those. And then I think fair information disclosure. I'm gonna use a live example, because it's always nice to give all of these topics, but you need to show how it works in practice. Um, and then the last two, repre representation of data and obviously ethics and, and social responsibility. So let's just take the one example of value creation and capital management. So I mentioned management compensation, right? This trust factor, do you trust management? Like I said, we invested alongside our shareholders. What you tend to find in our portfolio a number of the CEOs or chairmen are invested alongside us. So they have big, big stakes in the company and they score highly on this matrix. Um, has management created value? Before you look at any particular company, you know, you'll have to look at the management team and what they've done. Have they achieved success? Like we always scrutinize on our returns. Um, it used to be on a three, five year basis, it's now on a monthly basis, but um, is what we do to management teams as well. You know, we scrutinize what they've done. Have they created value for shareholders? And this is a very, very important factor for us. So then we get back to jo John Duncan. So this is our independent assessment as a team, but you know, as analysts, we, we have biases. If I like the company, you know, I tend to favor them on certain matrix. So we, John and his team, do an independent assessment with a similar framework, but with no in human intervention. All of these are, are automated and they look exac ex exactly the same things we look at. So based on their framework, the EM index um, scores 4.9, our own fund 5.6, and this company, Sun Pharmaceuticals, we, we, we've been adding to this company, scores 6.17. So this gives you an independent view or assessment of corporate governance of a particular company along with what we look at. So a very robust process in a market that's actually developing where the shareholder structures, corporate governance frameworks are not what they are, are supposed to be like in developed markets or in SA. So getting back to the example, there's this company called Global Mediacom for, for those of you who still have DSTV. 
Um, I'm sure it's only for the sport like I have it. But this is, this is the DSTV of Indonesia. Indonesia, fantastic country, 250 million people, very, very low penetration. Um, so this company, uh, this company has all the right ingredients for us and it's on a growth trajectory that, you know, NASPERS would have been on 10 years ago. So if you look at the share price of Global Mediacom, the next thing that's in our favor when we look at things, the share price came off significantly. So the share price created opportunity. So when you think about the value of the company and we do an analysis of, there was significant margin of safety in Global Mediacom. But where did they fail? On two occasions, the company produced the results late. So, you know, a company only it sends out its results late when there's something happening in the company or if something's wrong. Because you know you have two months after year in to produce those results, and if you're late after that, that means something's wrong. So those were the first um, warning flags. They decline invites to presentations we normally attend on a yearly basis, and they, they just weren't there. I mean, we did our corporate governance of assessment of this company and felt that you know they, they, w they weren't doing what we expected them to do. So this is a very good example. Lots of margin of safety, and I mean, I really like this company, all the right ingredients, but it failed our corporate governance assessment. And that company, you can see, is down 54% since then. So it's a very good example of what you can do uh, or how you can add alpha just by just focusing on your corporate governance besides your other factors that you look at. So in conclusion, I think, you know, emerging markets, very exciting opportunities. Um, Corporate governance, as I've just highlighted, is a key pillar in what we do, and I think longer term it adds value. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to ask our presenters to come up and sit up on stage, and uh, we're going to get to ask some questions. They're a bit shy, so it's, it's taking them forever to get going. Um, but hey, the, the economist uh, looks like she's going to start. Okay. Jeez, these are very high chairs. <laughs> <laughs> very high, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the first question. Yes, um, what does it mean? Do we think that we don't see structural reform in the near term? So. For SNP, they have until next year, June, in order to resolve the negative outlook that they have. And so that means we have very limited time in order to um, implement the structural reform, right? So everyone thinks that December is the end, that after that, um, if we have a good outcome in terms of the ANC electorate conference, then that will be the end all. It will save the country, we'll have business sentiments pick up, and everything will start flowing. But the the reality is that whoever wins still has the same budget. They're still sitting with a fiscal deficit that they need to narrow. And right now, with the under-recovery of tax revenues, etc., we're at a stage that we're worried about what this means for the budget going forward. We're worried about the fact that we have low growth in South Africa. So if you use our year-end forecast of 0.8%, um, add 4.5% to our inflation forecast as well and you're sitting at about 5.3% of nominal GDP. So if that's the growth, call that earnings for South African corporates as well. And our budgets, our debt servicing cost is about over 6.5%. So we run a risk of going into a debt trap because we have no growth in South Africa. So in the short to medium term, it's going to take a lot in order to turn um, growth around. So that's our key worry is that even though you do something small, you're going to need a lot of political will in order to change the direction where this economy is going. Thank you very much. Um, so the next one is for you, Feroz. So while we make this appear. There's something about GEM and gl versus global. Well, it did disappear, I think. But um, I think it was like something about why should you invest in GEM um, versus global. Um, yeah, I saw oh the question. Yeah. It was, um, why do we, because GEM is so volatile, why not just invest in global companies that invest in GEM? So, you know, I'm actually tired of this question, but... <laughs> um, <laughs> 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 uh, 
Firstly, those global companies are expensive, bottom line. The S&P is trading on 30 times, a, a shallow adjusted PE, so you're actually paying up for that. Most investors have, for the last five years, implemented exactly that strategy. So it's something that's played out already. I think, you know, when you go directly into GEM, the volatility comes more, because I've, I've given you some hope, I've given you some comfort on corporate governance, the volatility comes from the currency moves. Um, but I think uh, the factor that's in our favor here is that emerging market currencies versus purchasing power, real effective exchange rates, any matrix you look at are relatively cheap. US dollar, Japanese yen, uh, developed market currencies are very, very expensive. So that volatility, I think, is already priced in the market. And the big, big opportunities in GEM are actually the ones that are internally focused. So not the Unilever that's investing or selling product in India. It's a company like Sinovio Pharmaceuticals that's selling product to Chinese consumers. And that's where the big growth is, and that's where the big opportunity is. Okay. And then the, the next question, which is the, the top one now. So Nilesh will let you, because Tinyiko in her asset allocation was negative South African banks, and you told us about a bank in South Africa. So we'll, we'll start with you, um, and then we'll allow Tinyiko to try and defend her stance. Hopefully you don't come to blows. Sure. So I think just to think one point is just we, we are different lenses. So we are, we are looking at the pure equity kind of play where she's on the balance fund and she has kind of more, a bigger investable universe in terms of classes. So that's one. Two, within, I think it's financials, economic view. So we are overweight banks within financials. Financials is obviously a broader grouping. It has insurers and some property and general financial, depending on how you look at it. And if I'm not mistaken, I think they do have banks within the financials. And I think the last point is just timing. So when did we actually buy the banks? Um, you know, the point when we were buying was that very depressed prices where yields were actually you know, over 7% on the banks. And for us, that was an attractive entry point. And when we compared that relative to property, which were at similar yields, and we thought banks already had capital, so we had more sustainability over the dividend yields. So I think that's kind of sums up the three reasons for that. Yeah, I agree with what Nile said. So even in the financial sector, we do hold um, some banks. I mean, there's Capitec, which is a really self-help um, bank that does well in this economy. I mean, LaRue keeps saying that you can either focus on that high unemployment rate or you can focus on the employed people where you can get some bang for money there. So there are some companies where you can get some value. Remember, we are um, about getting value in terms of our stocks. So where stocks are cheap, we do invest. Okay, thank you. And then the next one, now this is a fascinating one for us. Uh, and it's directed at you. So I, I like this question. Uh, you can be the sage. Uh, of the tomorrow event. How do we go about solving the corporate governance problems in SA? I'm glad it's your question, not mine. <laughs> no, but do, you know do, do what, we, actually... Do we, do we hire auditors? I think we should hire auditors to help us solve the governance problems. <laughs> no, but I've got one better one. Sibu's actually better positioned to answer this question. No, I'm the MC. So I, I, get to direct <laughs> the, I get to direct the, the Q&A, so you, it's addressed to you. We're fortunate in South Africa, corporate governance isn't an issue in companies. We have the best corporate governance in SA companies. I think, you know, we're all well aware of what's happening and what's keeping the country back. The chart that should shock you the most was the private, uh, the investment from businesses in South Africa. What Tineco didn't show you or didn't tell you was that it's worse than 1994. And I remember in 1994, people were buying cans of baked beans and stuff. So it's actually worse than that. So it's very difficult because, you know, it's not at the company level and it's not in business. So for us to solve that problem is going to be a long process. You know, obviously we're well on our way. We have very good fiduciary uh, uh, duties in our country, very good uh, governance standards. But I think the next wave will probably come in the next four to five years when we have a transition in our government. Yeah. Remember, a country is as good as its leadership. 
Oh, okay. Peter, you didn't mean it. Okay, thank you very much, guys. And uh, yeah, we've run out of time. Thank you very much. Can we give our panel a hand? Okay. Now, uh, for our final session, which is uh, in Joburg when we did this uh, on Monday, Tuesday. This was very exciting. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, so Elise Boeta, our MD of our unit trust business, is going to come up and introduce the two gentlemen um, and then facilitate a debate uh, between them. Now, like I said, in Joburg, this became a heated debate uh, because Vusi, um, he's a confrontational character. I mean, he's on Twitter, he's active, and he fights with people. And then Vinny is a guy I only saw the other day, and he also seemed to be keen on a fight. So, uh, Elise, don't you want to come up and then introduce your, your two guests and then... Uh Fantastic. Thank you, Sibo. But before we introduce our guests, we are going to peer into the future. This is 12 years from now. But in December 2016, Amazon had the first drone-powered delivery done. Yes, it was a very humble package. It was a packet of popcorn and a TV stream stick. But nonetheless, it revolutionized an industry. And it changed the lives of the DHLs of the world forever. Matinet announce the day before yesterday, they are a Swiss logistical company, that in a month from today, they will be autonomous drones delivering laboratory items. For instance, blood, uh, like blood samples, blood definitions. It will go all over Switzerland's skies. Fantastic, fantastic innovation. But unfortunately, it's not all good. On the 19th of August, they intercepted a drone, and that drone tried to smuggle 13 pounds of meth into the States. So there's a whole new brand of drug dealer out there, and uh, we'll definitely have to look at that. And what about self-driving cars? Uber, this is a spec, and it's already on the streets of California and Chicago. And they've got 20 cameras, and they look around, make sure that they're not too close to any pedestrian. They make sure that they can see, is the robot green, is the robot red? And can you imagine one day, you're getting into your Uber, you're sitting and working, and you're driving to the office. But what does that mean for short-term insurance? How will that industry be reshaped? And will your children, if they're small, ever have the need to actually drive anything? And we thought these were the disruptors. They are not. Currently, they are testing flying cars in Dubai to see if they can solve the whole traffic issue there. So the disruptors are being disrupted. And then these are the new pharmacists. They're three to four times faster than humans, far more accurate, and they can work 24 hours a day. In March this year, there was the first operation assisted by a robot. It was a ear op because they were too nervous of getting close to the various arteries. So they sent in the robot 
So one of these days, we might be operated on by robots only. And we all know about IBM Watson. Nobody could figure out what was wrong with this individual. And within 10 minutes, after reading through 20 million journals, Watson knew it was a rare form of leukemia. It also happened in Germany earlier this year. A man was very ill. Nobody could figure out what was going on. They asked him various questions, and they inputted this into our AI. And they realized he's got a rare form of Bellagia. How did he get it? He cleaned his fish tank, and there were snails in it. That is the future of technology for us. And our very own Elon Musk started a fantastic company called Neuralink. He is one of the co-founders of that organization, and they are really starting to dabble in the world of cyborgs. So he said he can do electronic implant into the human mind, and that's where they're going, to improve memory. He's very worried about the fact that we can't compete with AI. And he's also saying that in time, by thought, we should be able to communicate with robots. Sci-fi. And it is happening every day. And yet, in finance, we won't be spared from this. We will also have the disruptors. And what is the future of finance? We already see that there's chatbots 24-7 speaking to people. We are seeing that there is algorithms trading. And we are seeing that there's AI that actually look at fraud detection. So they can see, is your spending habits different? And maybe we should worry about that. But what is the future of finance? And we've got a fantastic panel that is going to talk to us about that. And I want to introduce all of them to you now and ask them to come up. Firstly, Hal George, you met him earlier, our Director of Investments at uh, Old Mutual Investment Group. Then Vusi Tembekwao, also known as the rock star of public speaking. He was a speaker at the World Bank. He was a speaker at the House of Commons. Uh, he was actually on a TV program, uh, Dragon's Den, you might know him. So he's a serial entrepreneur, and uh, he's also a financier. And then uh, I think somebody that everybody has got one question for, and that's uh, uh, Vinnie. Vinny Lingham, he is the co-founder and CEO of Civic. They are an identity protection firm. He's also a board member of Bitcoin, the Bitcoin Foundation. And very interesting, something that's quite close to my heart, is he is also a co-founder of Silicon Cape. It's a South African-based organization that's looking to make Cape Town one of the innovation tech hubs of the world. So very excited about that. So we are going to have a panel discussion, but before we do that, we are going to give Vinny and Vusi, seven minutes, seven minutes only, to quickly give us an intro about how they see the future of finance. And we're going to start with, with Vinny. Vinny, over to you. Thank you. Morning, everyone. Let's see. Let's get this going. Cool. OK, seven minutes. Clock starts. Um, so I want to chat to you guys today about some of the macro trends um, that will impact investing. So from the perspective of what, what are the things which we're looking out a couple of years at, maybe even, uh, maybe even months in some cases? And, and how does it change the way you think about um, investments and, and the investment asset class? So Bitcoin has is, is come to the fore recently, especially in the past year, just because obviously the, the price rise, the media. Um, but the underlying technology around Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies has become very interesting. And you're seeing a move towards decentralization. And that really means instead of having central points of power um, and exchanges, et cetera, you're going to have um, you know, these cryptocurrencies and tokens being traded, and they already are around the world. So what does that mean? I think you, what you will see is in the next two years, you'll start seeing, uh, and you already, this has already happened to an extent in the US uh, with Overstock, um, companies listing their shares uh, onto the blockchain or onto a blockchain. And these shares being traded between wallets and not exchanges. So people could, you know, you, if you had shares in, in a company like Google, for example, and they had, a, and they had um, uh, created a tokenized version of their shares, it wouldn't have to go to a, through a stock exchange. You could trade it between people, and you'd have this whole notion of custodianship changing and, and centralized exchanges. And this is very powerful. And the way you achieve this while being compliant with the laws is having things like identity tied to um, crypto wallets. And, uh, and this is... What's interesting about this is if you look at the way that share registers work today, uh, and especially in some parts of the world where they don't have a lot of electronic um, share registers, shares go missing, you don't know who owns the shares, where they are, how they're sitting, and with blockchain, that all changes. So that's an area which I think will really impact investing over the next couple of years, and we can go into that later on the panel. Um, 
artificial intelligence. This is, uh, you know, I think we, we mentioned Watson early on, and there are a lot of other examples of how AI is changing, uh, changing the world of investing. I think in South Africa, one of the things which, which is um, a problem, uh, you know, compared to, is that you don't actually have as many stocks in the stock market as you do in the U.S. and other big markets. So when it comes to things like big data, um, AI is not as effective because you just don't have a, a spread of opportunities to, to, to invest in. But when you're looking at things like 10,000 shares on the NASDAQ and the New York Stock Exchange, there's just no way for one small firm in the U.S. to be able to go through all these shares, look at all the financials, look at all the inputs, and come up with um, you know, uh, good suggestions and ideas manually. But by using big data and AI and teaching and training algorithms, you can do a better job of selecting the, the shares and the asset classes that match what you're looking for in terms of alpha, in terms of your portfolio theory that, and your hypothesis. And th these are two areas which I think are, are going to be very important going forward as you see a decentralization of exchanges. So if you look at the first topic of how um, shares are traded centralized, you know, the NASDAQ versus JSE versus the, the other exchanges in the world, if you imagine a world where you can just buy shares from any country or any uh, you know, any company operating in any country, and, 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 and you don't have to have a JSE and a New York Stock Exchange. It's just globalized. And so then you think to yourself, hang on, if I can buy these shares and I can buy these, these, these tokens that are traded worldwide, how much more important is it to be able to go through tens of thousands of company data, companies' um, uh, you know, financial s uh, statements and data and, and, and monitoring social media, Twitter, and putting that all into a a system that you can help you find good opportunities for your investment thesis. Space tech. This is one I think is very interesting. I think we're only just getting to the point now where it's cheap enough for companies to launch satellites. And I think hedge funds and investment companies are the, are the interesting uh, first movers in this. If you had data from space about what's happening on Earth, could you make better investment decisions? If you could monitor vehicles going in and out of 10 different shopping centers owned by a listed company, and you could see the trends every single day on that data, would it make you do things differently? This is called information asymmetry, okay? Knowing something that others don't. Right now, you probably all get information from the same sources. You get it from Twitter, you get it from, from the financial statements companies put out, but where the hedge funds in the US have really succeeded, and, and one good example is in the hotel industry. Um, <laughs> and this is, not a, this is actually not a story, this has actually happened and still happens. A lot of the hedge funds go and put cameras outside the major hotel groups and they have AI bots monitoring to see how many lights go on and off at that hotel every night. And then they're able to arbitrage the market knowing what the financial outcome is probably going to be for that hotel group. So they're gathering the data on the ground. Imagine you can do that from space. Imagine you can have uh, geothermal scanning telling you what sort of deposits and commodities companies actually have versus what they say they have, or find opportunities to buy shares in companies who don't even know they're sitting on mineral deposits. This is very interesting because for the first time you can actually launch a satellite in space for uh, a you know, fraction of what it used to cost because of companies like SpaceX, which is founded by Elon Musk. And then the other thing is capital formation. I mean, if you look at the way the world works right now um, and where it has worked, you've always had you know, pension funds, large uh, investment funds, and, and th these formed LPs, limited partners in VC funds in the US, and the capital used to go and flow into the VCs and then get into the entrepreneur's uh, pockets that way. I it's changed. You now have a situation where people are doing ICOs and token sales and crowdfunding using cryptocurrencies and able to fund new and interesting projects um, without having to go through central, you know, central custodians for that value. Sure, there's going to be lots of risks. Sure, there's scams and there will be failures in that market. But if you take a long-term view of how capital is going to form uh, into projects, into companies over time, it's very likely that it will be less driven towards centralized um, uh, you know, vehicles and more crowdfunding type solutions. And, and if you look at the numbers, they're actually pretty interesting. The global crypto market right now is over $150 billion. That's the market capitalization of all the, the, the crypto tokens, Bitcoin, uh, Ethereum, Litecoin, etc. And that's growing, and that's up about 10x in the past year. And if you look at what um, you know, Mike Novogratz, who's one of the billionaire Fortress, uh, the Fortress Fund investors, he's a big cryptocurrency bull, and he thinks we're going to get to about a five trillion dollar market cap by 2022, which is five years away. How does that change the way we think about investing? If a lot of value is now going to accrue to decentralized, um, you know, tokens, cryptocurrencies, and infrastructure. 
if you look at just how ICOs have exceeded VC funding in the past uh, quarter, it's three times. So three times more money was raised by companies doing ICOs and issuing tokens to the public than what VCs have put into these companies. Now, again, China's just shut down um, the, the, the ICOs, but other countries like Singapore are putting in very good regulations, and so is Switzerland. So you're not going to have a situation where the whole world agrees on how this moves forward, but you are going to find the progressive companies giving a way forward for companies to continue to, to grow their um, infrastructure and their footprint by using crypto tokens. I'm out of time. Thank you very much. We'll see. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I think it's afternoon now. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to come and speak here. Before I start, let me just say that Vinny and I had a good punch up yesterday. <laughs> I won. Uh, so I'm, I'm sure he's ready himself to, uh, to get me back. I'm going to share with you uh, some thoughts and ideas. I work in the venture capital space. I run uh, what we believe to be one of the fastest venture capital funds, in, certainly in South Africa without question. We believe in the continent. Um, I'm going to capital raise now again, and I spend a lot of time trying to merge the two worlds that effectively you work in. Uh, a part of the challenge we face in trying to understand the markets we're in is that there are complexions of both first and third world kind of constructs in all of those markets. So a lot of the concepts and ideas you hear from first world type thinking can translate into our markets, but they have limitations and there is ad an adaptability premium that you've got to pay. So I'm going to speak to you over the next few minutes about understanding simply three key themes that are driving what's happening in, in the future of money, as it were. The first is, and I think Vinny made the point very eloquently, the decentralization of the flows of capital. Uh, the very idea that it is centralized and that there is a regulator that drives the movement of capital. The idea that, for instance, if I want to move money from here to Europe, I need the Saab clearance. That, that is changing. Now, at, at the moment, it's changing at a rate which is driven by people having access to the information about whether or not they can do so, but the, the, the tools to do so are there. That's the first thing I'll speak about. The second thing I'll speak about is understanding that economies are becoming increasingly cashless, and that changes how people behave. I'm going to be in Stockholm. Uh, I leave, in fact, uh, on... I leave for Qatar on Sunday, and then in Stockholm on a capital raise next week. There is an entire mall in Sweden, Stockholm, that doesn't accept any cash payments. An entire mall. So you, you either make card payments, or as I'll share with you, they're using an interesting technology from the Singaporeans. So that's what I'll speak to you about very quickly. Um, this is one of the investments we hold. It's an interesting little business called Cellulant. We're actually trying to claw more equity into this business, but it's become quite a hot flavor at the moment, my view. And I've said this to the team, is that it's probably trading at a premium, so we've got to give it some time. But this business is a very simple business. It's built by a Kenyan entrepreneur. It operates predominantly in the West African markets, and he's got two proprietary technologies. The first is in the West African space. For those of you who, of course, understand the history of our continent, there are parts of it that are Francophone, and then, of course, Anglo-Saxon. And there is a, often a, 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 a non-translation not only in language, but also in, in where you derive uh, transaction. If you've never, for instance, done business in Côte d'Ivoire, payments in Côte d'Ivoire don't clear in Côte d'Ivoire, they, cl they clear in Paris. Uh, so, for instance, if you're doing a transaction and you're being paid by a client in, in Côte d'Ivoire or, or Guinea-Conakry is a phenomenal example of this. I mean, even buying a donut in Guinea-Conakry, the payment actually clears in Paris. Right, so because, because the Reserve Bank of Guinea Conakry is not sitting in the country, it's sitting in Paris, right? But what these guys have been able to do with an interesting technology is because they've moved some of their consumer base into a cashless space, so they're integrating uh, the consumer business, the banking system, as well as the mobile networks into a singular platform, and on that singular platform, they're allowing trading. So whereas you have to worry in the past about, for instance, clearing payments, you don't have to anymore using their technology, and phenomenal rise in... Um, in, in the business and the value, and, and Ken, whom I've got a meeting with later on in the week, uh, later on when I come back, is uh, doing some interesting stuff. Uh, have a look at the rise of Capitec, and I think what they've proven for us is that the solution has to be a bit of a mix of both. I mentioned pick and pay here because just here in Cape Town, not so long ago, uh, pick and pay trialed a system where they accepted Bitcoin payments. They did it for a full week with limited success. Limited as a function of the vo volume of transactions not, that were done. There's nothing wrong with the technology. So as the adoption curve kicks up, and if I think there is a singular thing we learn from specifically emerging markets, is that the adoption curve will, will, will have a long tail, and then when it kicks up, if you've not bought in when it had that long tail, typically the rate at which it grows means you're going to pay a premium at the instance at which you're buying, what uh, Vinny calls dumb money. <sighs> 
India's interesting. Uh, Google Wallet is betting on what's happening in India. There are 400 million users of the internet in India. It's believed that there'll be 650 million by the year 2020. Just to understand it, that's something close on 63%. Uh, they're, they're a part of the population of India. And what Google has done is they've used, in effect, the fact that you all here have Gmails, which is a form of ID uh, authentication, and they're allowing you to transact using a Google Wallet. So you move currency from your actual money into the Google Wallet platform, and from there you can transact on a whole entire ecosystem of uh, people who are pegged onto the Google Wallet system. Very interesting. This is my favorite, EasyLink. Fascinating business in Singapore. I've been trying to set up a meeting with them for some time now. Uh, the Nats guys I know that who run and own this business uh, have had some uh, time and sort of scheduling issues. But it, what they've done is a world first. They accept payments using voice technology. Voice. Let's think about that. So you at a um, Starbucks, you walk up to the terminal, and you say, I'd like to pay for my, my donut, please. The terminal recognizes your voice because you entered into a registry that has recognized your voice, and then you leave. That's it. No cell phone, no card, no drone, <laughs> no phone call. <laughs> See, uh, the idea and what you, what you learn increasingly as you get immersed into this world of what the future is, is actually whatever you think it is, your, your ideas are probably conservative. It's kind of like the people that said the internet will you know, not reach more than 3% of the global population by the year 2100. You're kind of all in it now or on it, as it were. So what are the game changers? I think AI, uh, um, at least I think you're quite right in some of the ideas and thoughts that you've shared. Um, but AI definitely will change how the world is working for no, simple, for no reason other than the rate at which a machine can learn and unlearn far supersedes the rate at which human beings can unlearn. We are here in Cape Town today having a conversation about cryptocurrency because you're all refusing to learn. You get it, right? because you're stuck in a second industrial context, complex of thinking that assimilates value to a specific world. The world is industrialized. It functions based on a balance sheet. It values the value of the thing based on that assets and apportions to that a currency peg value. That's second industrial thinking complex. The machine will unlearn that in a minute. You press F5, you wipe the data set, you clean the hard drive, and you just load a new software. Whoops. Second trend, this cashless economy. This is coming. And I think specifically for those of you who are thinking about emerging, emerging markets, cashless, 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 cashless. Um, about two months ago, I was in uh, Zimbabwe. Uh, we just got a license now in Zimbabwe. Uh, everybody's leaving, I'm getting in. This is, this is kind of my thing, right? I mean, I, I am mad like that. Uh, but. At a meeting with the Reserve Bank governor in Zimbabwe, I said to him, could you tell me, how do you determine, uh, how do you determine your, what is your money supply in a market where you don't have currency? How, how do you know how many dollars are in the market? How, how do you tax? And he gave me a, a two-hour long-winded, very educated PhD thesis, the sum of which is, I don't know. <laughs> right. But what they're doing now in Zimbabwe, for those of you who've not been, if you go to Harare right now, there are queues around the, the, the sort of the, the, the entire block in banks. Because what they've done is they've limited the ability to which you can withdraw to $50 a day, unless, of course, you're linked to the Mugabe family. And as you saw the other day, Grace Mugabe's son just bought himself two Rolls Royces. Cash. Cash. Yeah? But $50 a day is what you're allowed to withdraw. What they're trying to do is to force the population into the cashless economy system, because if they put them in the cashless economy system, then they, they're hoping they can build a technology back end to enable them to manage the value that's been created in that economy. If they don't get it right, then Zimbabwe will kind of stay the doldrum that it is. If they do, my bet is it'll probably leapfrog many capital markets in this continent by 60 years. And that's why, it, like is all things with risk, I said to the team yesterday, risk is volatility. You all here are sort of funds that are constructed on the idea that you want to minimize risk and maximize you know, capital preservation, right? Risk is nothing more than volatility. It's you saying, I could invest a buck and get two or lose a buck. I don't want the volatility. So what I'll do is I'll invest a buck and I'll take a cent or two cents or three cents. In my world as venture capital, I don't wake up in the morning for anything less than 25% return. It just doesn't turn me on. Um, 
And then the third, and this is the, probably the most important, I'll end with this, is every single person in this room has a, you have a responsibility long, far beyond what it is that you do as a professional, but also as a human being to worry about the inequality gap, not only of South Africa, but of the world broadly. Now, we live in a world today that is increasingly, uh, we live in a world today that has not been as unequal as it is today. These are the facts as they are. The world today is wealthier than it has ever been. Global GDP is at highest levels. Human beings today have a longer life expectancy than we have on the entire history of a species called humans on this little rock called Earth. We are healthier, the world is wealthier. That being the case, the wealth is not distributed, which means the growing rate of inequality is a problem. Globally, you see it. Here, what it means here, particularly in Cape Town, is that almost every person in this room is living in a bubble. Now, unless Cape Town plans to secede itself from South Africa, and I don't think you can do, I suggest you start worrying about this. Because those refugees that were called from the Eastern Cape who came here looking for uh, opportunities will come here first generation from the Eastern Cape looking for work opportunities, but then they will stay here, their children will get educated here, and in this economy here in Cape Town, they will find your children in the place of work and they will seek the same opportunities that your children are getting into. You have a responsibility to worry not only about preserving capital, but also putting capital in its places and spaces where it creates a South Africa that is more evenly distributed. That is true self-preservation. Thank you. Thank you, Vinny and Rusi. First question I'm actually going to ask, how? Oh. Now, taking AI into consideration, we said, um, if we look at big data, what do you think is the impact of that for the asset management industry, and how does Old Mutual deal with it? Okay. Well, it's a big topic, and it's a prof profound impact. Um, I think there are two areas we need to focus on. Um, in the financial services industry. The first would be helping our end clients with their financial well-being. So what we're doing is doing a lot of work in terms of outcome-based work, as opposed to which fund should I buy or which scheme should I be with. How is my financial well-being going to play out when I'm retired? And getting people to that point, technology can hugely help us, both in terms of the way we manage our money and also how we communicate with our clients to help them on that journey. The second thing is how we actually run the money, and this is a huge topic for us. Um, I said at lunchtime yesterday that I was chatting to the co-chief investment officer of BlackRock a couple of months ago, and they've just merged their fundamental team with their quantitative team. Can you imagine how that would play out? It's not something we're going to do. But in terms of the importance of quantitative skills and big data and provision of information and interpretation of information, in terms of the way you run money and the use of AI to help you to do that, that's going to change our industry so fast and we have to be prepared for that. Luckily, at Old Mutual, we have the resources to be able to, to play that game. And we have the teams in customized solutions, particularly in the quantitative area, who've got a lot of long um, legacy of history in this. And so we have the tools to be able to do it. And uh, that's what we'll bring to, the, to you guys in terms of um, solutions which will benefit your clients. Thank you, Hal. I'm going to ask Vinny the next question. I kind of suspected this will come up. How does one value Bitcoin? It's a great question. Yeah. So, so let, me, let me ask you, because yeah, let, let's ask the question as to, as, it's really a capital flow valuation. It's not based upon earnings. I mean, th this is the mistake I think people make, is they look at Bitcoin and they go, well, it's like an equity, but there's no earnings, there's no yeah. income, it's like gold, it's a scarcity, store of value. Like, th there's a lot of ways of, of, of arguing for it. At the end of the day, if you say that it's the world's first digital currency, or first digital commodity, well, then how is it th any different from uh, any country that issues its own currency? I mean, how do you value the rand? Why do you own rands versus dollars? Uh, like, why would you buy Swiss francs? You buy it because it's an index of the underlying economic activity within that country. So in the same way, Bitcoin is effectively an index currency of all the other cryptocurrency activities within the digital crypto economy. And, and so, you know, the, it's the same. I mean, it literally applies to every single currency in the world. Like there is, uh, there's some 
unit of measure which denominates economic activity for that juris jurisdiction that actually values um, the economic activity. And so in, in Bitcoin, we have activities like mining, where people are investing money in buying uh, mining equipment, they're paying for um, salaries, they're paying for electricity. There is an economic activity within there. And then there's companies using that infrastructure for payments, remittances, uh, identity, etc. So it's, it's not an easy question to answer. And, and look, the reality is that the market is the market. These th coins are traded worldwide. There's $2 billion a day of trade, just like you have in the currency market. So you don't have to have earnings to have a valuation, because if you did, then you know, <laughs> every country's currency on earth would be in trouble. Now, another big disruptor is blockchain. So, Vusi, I'm going to maybe ask you and Hal the next question. Uh, how can I invest in the idea of blockchain new disruptor coming without investing in a specific cryptocurrency. Maybe we should also talk about the difference between blockchain and Bitcoin. I'm going to ask Vinny to help me here, but my understanding is that uh, Bitcoin is, is an actual, um, um, for lack of a better word, an actual currency. Blockchain is a technology. So Vinny's business is, for instance, uh, latest business, Civic, effectively uses uh, blockchain technology to do ID verification for people working in this ecosystem of dig cryptocurrencies. Am I right? Yep. 10 points. <laughs> so, 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 I mean, there's an example, just to answer the, the, the question more, more specifically, there's a company called Shapeshift, and they have a product called Prism, and Prism basically is, um, if, you know, if you were, it's, it's got a whole bunch of cryptocurrency specialist people, like myself, for example, who can go uh, put together a portfolio of currencies, and it's kind of like a unit trust. And you can go in and you can say, I want to, I want to buy cryptocurrencies that are, I want to buy into Vinny's portfolio. And then you go and put in, you know, whatever, a couple of thousand bucks, or whatever. And you can clone my portfolio. And then I, when I trade in and out of those, those crypto, if I move, remove one coin, it's like, it's like a basket of shares, the same, the same way the shares work. And so I think it's, it's prism.exchange. You can go there and that's one way of, of getting more of a broader exposure to a, a bunch of cryptocurrencies. And you can look at like, you know, the, the performance of myself, and I, I don't use it much, but I'm, I'm just saying people like me who have got performance over the past 12 months or six months, or what their returns have been, and you can clone their portfolios and, and easily make one um, transaction invest in all those. Can I just, if I may, just make a quick point, sorry, Hal, if I may jump in here, but I made the point when we were back in Joey's that I, so, Vinny and I first probably met about a decade ago, and at the time we were having an argument over one of those online chats uh, Facebook was raising capital at a uh, pre-money valuation of $15 billion. I'm a trained finance guy. I run DCS. What's the industrial That's mindset that you... Uh, easy. Easy. <laughs> easy. He's changed. And, and, he, yeah. and he and I got into an argument, and I said, there's no way this thing is worth $15 billion. Like, Based on what? Show me the revenues. Show me the, show me the capital infrastructure. Show me a balance sheet. Nothing. Uh, what's the value of Facebook today? What, 500 billion? 450, 500 billion dollars. There you go, right. So I didn't understand it then, right? That's the first point I want to make. Second time, we're in the set of Dragon's Den. He and I are busy changing in the back, both of us half clothed, me lo <laughs> oh, looking dear. better than he is. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I says to him this whole Bitcoin thing, you know, like, uh, how's it work? He says to me, you should buy some Bitcoin.
remains to be seen. In the meantime, the way to invest in blockchain and Bitcoin ICOs is outside of the public markets. Hmm. And that's a problem for the people we serve in terms of the ordinary customer because they find it very difficult to access. Because this is kind of a rich man's game at the moment. It's venture capital, it's, it's the Silicon Valley guys and the rich guys who can get in. Hmm. But what we can do as custodians of large pools of assets is deploy those large pools into these kinds of areas through venture capital, through private equity, through more interesting investments yeah. And the end beneficiary then is our end client who can't otherwise access these interesting things. That is a very interesting question that I want to get to. Can, can, can I just yes. get, get one minute back on that? Yes, so of course. He's absolutely right. Bitcoin has gone through four, uh, it's called four bubbles and busts. Everyone bigger than the previous one. The current price we're in right now is when we hit 5,000, I was like tweeting out about it's, it's a bubble for now. I think it's a You're still bubble. Holding. Um, there's a long term. There's a long term view, and you can hold okay. a certain portion, you know, long term. And I mean, I sold a whole bunch of bitcoins earlier this year as well. But um, I think that th what happens is it's the hype cycle where everyone goes, "This is about to take off." They all buy it up. It runs up. The dumb money comes in, and then it crashes down because the smart money is selling to the dumb money, and then everyone's like left holding the bag, <laughs> and it goes through the cycle over and over. So you'll see it come come down. It's like 3,700 right now. 3,600. It may drop down to 2,000, even lower. Who knows? But then, you know, it's a far cry from where it was, you know, yeah. three years ago. Yeah. And then the next cycle will take it to the 20,000s plus. You know, and so you're going to have these ups and downs along the way. And I think it's just part of the, the nature of, you know, technology and people who understand it, people who don't come in, they learn. They don't make the same mistakes the next time, but the, the pool gets bigger, you know, every single time. And I think it's, it's, it's part of the natural cycle. I, I will make one comment, though. I think that what's happening in capital formation is that the wealth the wealth um, accrual of this ecosystem is not going to the wealthy necessarily. It's actually going to the younger generation, the kids who have, it's not difficult to buy cryptocurrencies online. In fact, anyone can do it, okay? But it's the young guys, the millennials that have the technical expertise, the knowledge, the willingness to learn how to go open up an account with an exchange, buy these things. Like I've got so many friends in Silicon Valley who bought into Ethereum and you know, put in what, five, ten thousand dollars sitting with ten, twenty, thirty million dollars worth of Ethereum right now. And it's not just them. People around the world have been doing it. There's a, a huge generation of wealth in the millennials who are they've got the time to go spend and research and like everyone here is sitting in their jobs, they've got kids, you've got you, you don't have the time to spend, you know, hours a day trading cryptocurrencies. And if you look at all the chat rooms today, it's all these young sixteen year olds, eighteen year olds, twenty five year olds you lost them trading it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, 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 the, so, and when these things go through these parabolic sort of curves, where it goes from $15 billion market caps to $150 billion to, you know, whatever, $5 trillion, it's not coming from people in this crowd because you just don't have the time to understand this new industry, but the young kids do, and that's where the wealth, mm -hmm. and, and, and so the wealth is going to them. So that's a question we must ask later as well, but I was very excited to see the following question uh, because it's a nice and controversial. Does this decentralization also seek to delegitimize the current new liberalist and capital structures? Is this the start of a revolution? Can I take a step at yes. that? Yes. Please. I, just, I want to do, from, just from a political perspective, uh, neoliberalist, my God. Yeah, what the hell? <laughs> sure. Um, <clears throat> You go. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's a very broad question because it doesn't apply to every country in the world uh, equally, right? So there's this, there's this notion that the capitalist structure, I mean, maybe you're looking at it from a South African perspective. One of the problems in South Africa is going to be as you know, younger folks go and buy small amounts of Bitcoin or whatever else and, 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 transfer and, and they acquire these assets and they do go through 10x, 100x movements, all of a sudden these kids are sitting with millions of dollars in offshore you know, untraceable cryptographic accounts, wallets, and they can just leave the country, go spend it over there, come back and live in South Africa and not pay taxes. Yeah. So how do you track this stuff? Um, you know, yeah. it's... I, I wanted to say, that's why I stopped and I said, you go. The, the question is, by its very nature, the question is, pre is presumptive that there is a global agenda yeah. that yeah. seeks to keep a... There the, the, the might have been at a point in time. I mean, if you study, I suppose, 13th, 14th, 15th century economics and you understand the system of mercantilism, which is the reason why we have imports and exports as part of the GDP calculation, there certainly was a global agenda. That's why Africa was for many, many centuries a provider of nothing more than natural resources to the rest of the world, and that's it. However... South Africans need to come to the realization, please excuse this, the technical term, that the shit that got us into where we are will not get us out of it. This is what bores me with our current politicians, is they think the same way those who put us here thought. 
they think that's going to fix the problem. So this is, this is not a revolution, start a revolution, take people out of power. That's not what this is. What this is is a global movement of people who are saying that there is an alternative to the system that exists. What we do with it is up to us. I just think sometimes we have to take off our political lenses sometimes. Just, you know, stop watching the news for a week or two and just come into the world that is not um, polluted by that filter and, and see things differently. This is not, hey, this is not a neoliberalist capitalist agenda to disimpoverish people. That's not what this is. It's simply an alternative system and that alternative system will take off because it has in it a functional value of creating value at a lower marginal cost. Now, I have to answer That's that it. question. So what do banks say about Bitcoin? Okay, but before you go, just, just to finish on Vusi's point here, the, let's understand one thing, okay? What is causing this, this to be a movement okay, of, of epic proportions, if you think about it globally? It's one simple thing. If you think about it, if you look at all the, if you look at the, the philosophy around Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, it's why do we have inflation worldwide? Why do we have inflation? Because inflation really takes, it, it, it steals money from the poor, sure. if you think about it. Sure. And, it and it gives it to the wealthy. Why do we have inflation on a global scale? It's unprecedented if you think of how, how it's been done. If you look at how um, money's being printed around the world. And this is really... Uh, Bitcoin was founded in the wake of the 2008 financial crisis because it was basically meant to be a deflationary currency. It was the world's first digital commodity currency with a deflationary sort of uh, curvature. So you could stop all this. We could, if we could regulate, if we had every country in the world's regulators, we could stop all this with one simple rule, one simple law, okay? Countries everywhere in the world do not issue a single printed single dollar or rand of your currency more. Put a hard cap on the limit of currency you put out there. This industry would disappear overnight. But that's not going to happen. So what's happening? We're creating alternative <laughs> currencies. And we're saying these currencies are going to be decoupled from the existing economies of the world where the money is not trusted by people in the world. Because look at Zimbabwe. You know? so I, think we, these, the, I do want this question answered about what about the banks? We see maybe you can say how do they feel about it? One yeah. sentence because we've got one minute left. Uh, <coughs> you go. <laughs> I mean, look, for the banks, the issue is compliance, okay? The banks really, in my opinion, they don't really care about whether they're managing rands, dollars, or Bitcoin in terms of a currency. They're all, it's all the same. The real issue is because it's digital, it can, it can be transferred past borders. Yeah. Uh, it's a compliance nightmare for banks. Yeah. And, and then it can be used to fund illicit activities, terrorism, the same way the internet's used for it as well. So the compliance issue is what banks are struggling with yeah. right now. Can I just say, you're 100% right. In the US, the issue is compliance. Here, I'll show you, it's very different. So it's capital so, controls, that's still compliance though. Yeah, so in, in specifically in South Africa, you've got to remember that banks were effectively created to be a trusted third party. Mm -hmm. The idea behind banks was I wanted to pay you for goods and services, you wanted to deliver the goods and services, you didn't believe I'd pay you once you delivered them, I didn't believe you'd deliver them once I paid you. So we invented, we did, this trusted third party to whom I would deliver the money and he would say to you, I've got the money, you can deliver the goods now. That's all a bank was. In this system, that trusted third party is no longer necessary. Okay. Uh, smart contracts, yeah. And my yeah. parting question, and I'm going to end with how, mm. but my parting question for the two of you, we've got a lot of pension fund trustees, we've got people that invest on behalf of pensioners. Should they invest into cryptocurrencies, into this new world that we're talking about? We see we can start with you. I'm, I'm gonna steal I'm gonna steal a page from Vinny's book here. He came up with an idea yesterday and I'm gonna steal it. He steals my stuff. I, I always steal his stuff. True story. Even on the even on the set of dragons then. Seriously, I would say something in the previous clip and then he would use it in the next clip. But admittedly, both the transactions I did with you and your advice, I lost money. So. <laughs> he is learning. Okay. Um, so, just to, so just a quick one. I think he, Vinny had a suggestion yesterday and I actually kind of didn't sleep last night thinking about it. But Sorry. What, what I, would, I think for me, as a, a young South African, I'm under the age of 35, I've got three kids, my oldest son's seven, my youngest is two months. So I'm kind of here, I'm not going anywhere, right? Educated all over the world, I could live anywhere I want, I'm here. Here's what we need. We need asset classes, people who control capital, the likes of what you do, to take a smidge of that capital and put it in spaces where you don't know what's going on. And be comfortable with the fact that you don't know. 
We need one or two percent of the capital you're holding given to alternative asset classes, the likes of venture capital, which we are. Give it to us and let us invest it in entrepreneurs that are going to build the future of this business quickly. I have to make this point. Please understand why South Africa doesn't have innovations because we don't have a history of it. This country and its economy was not constructed on the base of innovation. It was constructed on the base of protectionism. 55 million citizens living in this country. There are five major banks, six major clothing retailers, seven major food retailers. None of them were were created because they were innovative. They were created because the law allowed them to be built. Now, how we fix that going forward is by diversifying the supply chain of, of, of entrepreneurs who are willing to build innovative businesses, which is why everybody's feeling uncomfortable about doing this kind of stuff, because we don't have a history of doing it. What we need is a little bit of faith. That's what I'd ask. Vinny, yes or no? I, I, think, I think the biggest risk right now to cryptocurrency is people who don't know what they're doing buying it. And I think that's a big issue. So I think there are, you know, if you want to invest, there are, I, I'm happy to give you referrals to cryptocurrency hedge funds, cryptocurrency funds. Uh, you know, there's like, there's a ton of them in Silicon Valley with people who have got the technical skills, expertise. You know, they, they may not get you the, the, the 200x on a specific currency which goes to the roof because they have a more conservative approach to things, but they'll get you exposure to the sector and give you returns which are going to be outsized and you know, I think that's the, that's the key thing here. Yeah. You want to make sure that you, you put, you, you, you probably don't want the volatility and you don't want the, the but you want, you want a higher better opportunity. There are funds to do it. I, I wouldn't be directly investing in cryptocurrencies unless I was technically, um, you know, So proceed with it. caution. Yeah. Hal, I want to change the question to you a little bit. We've got some uh, custodians here. We've got trustees here. What do you think is the future that they should worry about and we should worry about in the industry going forward? Well, I think there's two things stick in my mind. Um, firstly, of course, fresh in this conversation. Um, the reason things change so quickly in technology, and the reason we're talking about in artificial intelligence today, when we wouldn't even have been thinking about it 18 months ago, or driverless cars, as you showed, two years ago, oh, that'll come down the pipe maybe in 10 years' time, and now they're driving around the streets. Why does that happen so fast? It happens so fast because of Moore's law, where computing power doubles every 18 months, plus Einstein's eighth law, eighth wonder of the world, which is comp compounding. You get something doubling every 18 months and it compounds, it goes exponential. So that's why these things come up so fast. So the first point would be we have to engage with these things because they're going to change our world really quickly now. And the second thing which is sticking in my head is um, back to Vuzi's point, I guess, in terms of our responsibilities as citizens. And we all run share portfolios and bond portfolios and we, we trade shares with each other as clients. We don't deploy a lot of assets into the real economy and in real assets. Be they infrastructure, we talked a lot about today, be it agriculture, be it technology, be it venture capital, be it private equity. That's money from our pools of assets, the savings of this country, which directly benefit the nation we live in. So I would urge you to look at that area and let's up the amount we all invest in real assets and let's make a difference. Call me. Thank, <laughs> 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 Thank you, Vusi, Vinny and Hal. And I'm handing back to Sibu to wrap up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Lunchtime. Um, we've reached the end of our day. And uh, I think in part... Hello? Yeah. Um, in parting... When we started off the day, I opened about responsible investing and why responsible investing is important. And uh, in closing, uh, I remember a few years ago, probably five, six, seven years ago, we were running um, an SA-based fund, and uh, we were having a bit of a boardroom tussle um, with a listed company on the JSE. And I remember eventually the chairman gave us a call because when these things happen, they can get in the media and you get in trouble and they get ugly. And he asked us why were we bothering? Because the issues uh, was a bit of a governance issue, but it wasn't really that big a deal, but we were making it a big deal. And then we said to him, you know, in South Africa, South African companies, because of our governance and our accounting standards, we get a good rating relative to our emerging market peers in terms of how the markets perceive and price our assets. We said, well, if we have a slide in that, if we start sliding down the rankings in terms of where our governance standards are, um, actually, we are all going to lose because the market will look at it and say, hey, you know what, why should South Africa trade here? 
Because if you look at West South Africa trades as a market, relative to our comparable emerging markets, considering our growth, our population dynamics, we shouldn't trade where we trade. But we get a premium. Why? Because of great governance and great accounting standards and a great culture of actually withholding that. And so why does this matter? It's because if that perception changes globally, we are all affected. Because the market will get a derating and we all lose and all our clients lose. And that's why this conversation matters. And uh, so with that in mind, thank you very much for joining us. Lunch will be served over there. And I believe those who had uh, parked at the ICC, their parking tickets that you, you got. But thank you very much. And uh, in closing, hopefully you'll join us again next year. Thank you. <laughs>